just a bloke in a bar. What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to another episode of Bloke in a Bar. And look, you may be looking at me going, geez, you're looking good. And that's right, next Monday, 6 p.m., the hats, the green and gold hats, the green and gold hoodies, the green and gold shirts and spray jackets are going live. That is right, 6 p.m. next Monday. Once this drop is done, we will not be doing hoodies for a whole nother year. We will not be doing for the rest of the year and then the rest of that, half the next year, we will not be doing hoodies again. So if you want to get a bloke hoodie, make sure to be there Monday, 6 p.m. Very limited number, guys. The hats are back. Remember last time the hats sold out really, really quickly. So set it, set aside your little shekels, put your alarm on, 6 p.m. Monday, guys. And it is, if, it's, if you love the show and you want a way to support it, this is the best way. Plus, these jumpers are really, really high quality, guys. Trust me, once you wear them, You'll, uh, you'll know what I'm talking about. Root, how you going, brother? Good, mate. Nothing beats green and gold. Oh, Fantastic. yeah. Absolutely. As you can see, all the boys were all dressed, matching. A bit of unity before the disunity that we will feel <laughs> on Wednesday. Uh, Timmy, how you going, brother? I'm good, mate. Look good, feel good, and uh, very, very comfortable. Hoodie's my favourite of all the drops, I reckon. Actually, massive, massive Timmy, you walked in in our old hoodies, didn't you? I, I love, I'm a big hoodie guy. And compare the, the, the quality of that hoodie to our old hoodies. It's amplified, and I was a huge fan <laughs> of the, the old, old hoodie, mate. So what does that say? Hammy, how you going, brother? Very good. Enjoying the unity while it lasts. Yep. Um, enjoying the green and gold, and what a day to do it. Travis Bazana, uh, a bit of Baz Ball, has gone number one <laughs> in the MLB draft. He's off to Cleveland. I was hoping my beloved uh, Hiroshima Calf might have snapped him up, but uh, <laughs> maybe maybe later in his career we'll get a piece of the, the Baz Ball action. Um, and also, guys, another huge announcement. It's survey time again, but this time we're going big. We're going real big. In the show notes, in Apple or Spotify or YouTube, go into the link it'll let, and you got to fill out a quick survey. We're giving away two prizes, $500 cash randomly to two special winners that fill this survey out. All you got to do is fill the survey out and then you, have a, you go into the draw to win one of uh, two five hundred dollars so in total we're giving a thousand dollars away so two people five hundred dollars cash each uh will win all you got to do is fill out the survey so not only you get that cash but trust me guys it helps us so much when we go into brands and we say this is what the audience is thinking these are the segments they like also it helps us uh, put together the show so we can look at like what segments you guys enjoy, you don't enjoy. So it takes you two seconds. It really helps the show. Plus, you got a chance to win five hundred dollars. Root, I can see your head moving there. What's going on, mate? Tim Williams just filled out his sixth one. <laughs> <laughs> Tim Williams, yeah. Wim Tilliams. That wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> Jim Williams. I'm here to Zach win. Hoskins. Here to win some cash, boys. <laughs> <laughs> so five hundred dollars. You got a chance to win five hundred dollars. We're giving away a thousand dollars. So go to the show notes. Click the links. It takes you. Five minutes max, and I promise you guys, it genuinely, genuinely helps the show. So if I could ask of you one thing, take five minutes to do it, plus you've got a chance to win $500. It's 500 smackaroonies. Also, don't forget, Origin Live Show, as soon as the game finishes, game three, the decider, we are going live on YouTube. Me, Timmy, Hammy, and Maddie. Plus, we may have a special guest. We're still working on that. But me, Timmy, Hammy, uh, Maddie will be there as soon as the show wraps up. So make sure to be there straight after the show on our YouTube, reviewing the series and the winner of Origin 2024. All right, let's get straight into it, shall we? Let's face a bit of music brought to you by our partners at Sportsbet. As always, give us a follow on the feed. Takes two seconds. You can copy real bets from real people. Uh, Alex Volkanovsky's on there. There's heaps of, there's heaps of people on there. Heaps of, you've, got the, you've got Hammy on there. You've got uh, Roasties on there. So go to Sportsbet. Go to feed. Give us a follow. Let's get into it, shall Volkan we? Volkanovski, uh, Roasty, and myself, all your favourite athletes are on there. So exactly. <laughs> get around us. Give us a follow. Um, all right. Before we get into it, try July flying as yes. well at the moment. We've the boys raised... picked up the slack. Yeah, they have. They have. They're after a bit of a slow start, uh, as we go to air this morning, the current tally is sitting at $125,000 raised wow. uh, for Tony Hunt and the Australian Skin Cancer Foundation. My boys, the West Tigers, doing their bit for charity. Uh, the Sharkies had five try celebrations on Friday night, so uh, good to see the boys chipping away there. But uh, keep them coming. <laughs> Uh, if we see one in origin as well, we've been known to donate a little bit more. So Ooh, I don't know if we'll okay. see a, maybe a repeat of the grenade or uh, or something similar on, on <laughs> the Wednesday. Cursed night. grenade. But uh, yeah, give us something, any players out there that might be watching. Um, all right, let's get into it. So 
Uh, Friday night, we had, sorry, Thursday night, we had the Dolphins. Um, 36 defeat the Bunnies, 28. Looks like Wayne's still coaching the Dolphins for the time being. Yep. I think is the one thing we learned from that game. Uh, congrats to Kempi, Rue and Timmy, who had the Dolphins to win and cover the one and a half points. Uh, hard times for Maddie and myself, who had the Bunnies. So, well done, boys. Off to a good start. Shout out to Maddie, who opened his tip with, are you blokes serious? <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't, but I, uh, I thought it was specials. But anyway, yeah. moving on. Yeah, bit of grade one carry on from Maddie there. There was grade um, one. Maybe Docker Point, we'll see. We leave and we learn. Uh, Sharks 58, nail bite of this one. Defeat the Tigers at six. Uh, just before I get into the who tip what, Adam G, fair to say, undid all the goodwill from the grand final. <laughs> <laughs> or, would that be fair to say? Or we'll, we'll get into we'll it get later. To yeah, later. Yeah, we'll, we'll get, get to the game later. We'll get to it later. later. Uh, obviously, I had the Tigers head to head. The rest of you had the Sharks head to head, which was correct. But you all had the Tigers with the plus 12 and a half, which was not even close, unfortunately. Uh, we'll put that one behind us for the Tigers. Titans 24 defeat the Eels 16. Kempi unsuccessfully smelt an upset. He backed the Eels. The rest close. of us helped ourselves to two points. I thought we, for a second there, I thought I was glory was close. And then, yeah. There was a pulse. There was a pulse <laughs> yeah. uh, towards the end of the game. But the rest of us had the Titans uh, to win and cover the four and a half. Uh, Broncos 26 defeated by the Dragons 30. Um, sensational stuff by Maddie and myself, who both had the Dragons. Uh, Timmy and Rue had the Dragons with the start, which was seven and a half points. Campy, you went all in on the Broncos, unfortunately. Whoa. Seven in a row now? Yeah, I think so. Six in a row. Six, six in a row. I haven't won one since Magic Round. It was yeah. just by a point. Tough gig. Tough yep. gig. Hang in there, mate. <laughs> uh, and then to bring us home, Manly 44 defeat the Knights 6. Uh, now, we were all pretty excited about the 280 on offer for the Knights at the time. <laughs> they actually jumped at three bucks. Uh, but that turned out to be way too short anyway. No points for the Sunday game. We all had the Knights. As, as the great Rue says, the bookies, are they're always right. <laughs> well, they were. <laughs> they were spot on. <laughs> they were spot on. I, uh, uh, I saw the Knights early last week at $2.30 and thought that was value. Yeah, crazy. Yeah. Crazy. So, they went out to three bucks. It's just, it's crazy how good they are. Yeah. Um, so well played. Uh, all right, so our results this week. Uh, beers and break evens on top of the ladder. Six points each for Timmy and Rue. Well done, boys. Nice, Rue. Matty on five points. Myself on four. And uh, securing a three, Pete. Uh, three weeks in a row. <laughs> uh, but I got a laugh last week, so I get a point. You do. <laughs> Thank you. So that's, and now we're even. And because you just tried to rob me and make me look silly in front of everyone, I think you alone should say the joke. Well, I hadn't really prepared a joke. <laughs> that you would be saying the joke. Hey? I hadn't really prepared one on the substance that you were going to be saying the joke <laughs> this week. Hey, man, the rules are rules. I got a laugh last week. I get a point for the laugh, don't I? Isn't that the so rule? So you square, are you? That would make a square, yeah. All right, yeah. so what do you rock off for the. Uh, no, I just. I nearly just got robbed unfairly. So it should be the person that robbed right. me unfairly. Right. I, I guess it depends how much you want to dock Maddie for his carry on last week too. Yeah, that's also true. Yeah, that's true. So just at the risk of this segment going a little bit too long, I'll just I'll just do the joke this week. Okay. Um, and I'll to tie, but I'll, I'll take one for the team here. Okay. Uh, now this one is to just keep up with the news that uh, England shat the bed this morning in the in the US. Great moment brought the nation together. Uh, bad news for England football fans. Um, diarrhea is actually her hereditary. You heard about this? <laughs> Yeah, it runs in the jeans. So. <laughs> Got the jeans on there too. A good joke, well told. That'll be a point for me next week. <laughs> How does he keep up with the news like oh, that? Oh, wow. Unbelievable. Oh, that's very good. good. All right, let's get into it. Let's preview uh, Origin. Game three, the decider. Uh, I mean, geez, the nervous energy. It's getting, it's building, it's building absolutely because it's one thing if, from a Queensland's perspective, let's say we were this game was in the decider was in New South Wales and we lost in New South Wales. That stings. It stings. But if we lose in Suncorp and that it's such a, a fortress, it's absolutely huge. And and on the flip side, as a New South Wales fan, if you go up to Suncorp and win, like you, <laughs> hasn't been done since two thousand and five. Like the the glory that is awaits you guys. Not only is it not in Sydney, it's at Suncorp. It could be one of the great wins that you guys have seen in a very, very long time. Yeah, I heard Joey talking, uh, I think it was last week or the week before, about how you know you only get X amount of like, games like this in your career, whether it be grand finals and origins in Suncorp. They don't come around <laughs> all that often. Big deciders like this. It's uh, <laughs> like a, the, these Blues boys, like especially a, a guy like Mitch Moses. Imagine this, where, where this would leave his career if he's the halfback that turns him around from 1-0 to winning in Brisbane. They're crazy. Ironically, it's like... It's such a New South Wales thing where if he goes up and does this, it makes selections even harder next year. Heaps harder, <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> which is like such a New South Wales thing because that's a it's almost a, a negative is how hard your selections can be sometimes. Um, but yeah, I mean at the moment, so the Blues are playing two dollars and two cents. The Maroons are playing dollar eighty. I think that'll come in. I really do. I think it'll come in as as we head towards um, kickoff. I just. I don't know. As I said, I've been saying it since probably since game two, really. I, I'd, I would have the Blues as favourites. Everything building towards them doing something great, especially when you look at the minutes of footy that they played in this series specifically. You take away all the history. You take away, oh, well, they haven't won at Suncorp for this. Every year is a new year. So I understand the idea that, yes, okay, there are going to be calls that New South Wales don't get at Suncorp. Like, that's just... That's just the way it is. It's human nature. So I understand that. But the idea that because it hasn't been done before, the chances decrease each year that you don't win at Suncorp, I don't think that's even like mathematically true because it's a new group of players every single year. And there's something about this New South Wales side where they have a swagger. Like There is a sense of confidence. There is a sense of you. they've got players littered throughout the side that are now have won three premierships. Like... They've been at the biggest stage multiple times and got the job done mm. in key positions. Oh, like, yeah, most key positions. Yeah, look, it's fascinating, but, like, history tells a story and it's there, it's there for a reason and that's why, you know, it's obviously impacted the odds because I think we said last week or the week before, but at a neutral venue, the Blues probably do go in as favourites and as you said, they're premiership winners. There was game one, the send-off, where we were in that game as well. Mm. Everything sort of says that the Blues should potentially be favourites in this, but I said history's there for a reason. It's been a long time since we've won a decider at Suncorp Stadium, and there are good reasons for that. So I, I'm i with you, Kempi. I think it does probably come in a little bit before game time because it always seems to with Origin. Mm, yeah. lose, it always balances out a little bit close to it, but I think it's in my head it's an even money game. Well, actually, I put together some stats to answer a comment. Um, basically, what I was saying was is that I don't think Queensland are worried about you know, scoring points or creating opportunities, I think Queensland are worried about um, defence and stopping the roll-on of New South Wales. And a comment basically said um, they do have a problem scoring points. Look at the first two series. And I looked at the stats and funnily enough, the line breaks, Queensland are at 12-6 compared to... So game two, New South Wales had more post-contact, more metres, and you absolutely dominated the game. Guess what the line breaks were? Five each. Mm. So it's just to me that... Um, Attacking wise, it's not an issue, but uh, Clarkie's rugby league column has put up these stats in a, um, more of the stats together. So, across the whole um, series so far, Queensland have more points. They got double the line breaks, so 12 to 6, um, and they're winning their penalty count. So, New South Wales have given away 11 penalties, Queensland have given away nine penalties. But outside of that, New South Wales have won possession. They've got 11% better set completion, which is crazy. 95 tackle breaks compared to 68 uh, Queensland. Their metres gained is 3,606, which is insane to think they played a whole game with one player less and they've got more metres over the series. Uh, post-contact metres, they have 200 more post-contact metres with 1,230 compared to 1,039. They've got 30 offloads to 10 against Queensland. Uh, tackles, 630 tackles to 755 of Queensland. Uh, missed tackles, 68 compared to 95 of Queensland. Uh, errors, they've only made 16 and Queensland have made 24. So essentially on every start, uh, New South Wales have dominated, except for um, the key, like the big one where you would assume Queensland would dominate, which was the line breaks one. I think we all of us going to this series looked at the Queensland side and said, look, they, they can break the line with their ball playing, with their silkiness. But outside of that, New South Wales have completely dominated this series. Also worth noting on that line breaks, like obviously game one with one less player, but I think Queen, the Queensland won that one, seven to one mm. in that game, as they should have mm. with the extra player. But then you go game two where they got towed up and they still equaled. Mm. So, um, and you could you could even look at that like you go back to the the meters. The New South Wales lost a player, and they still had three hundred more meters. They still have nearly thirty more tackle breaks, um, twenty more offloads. So even so, you basically have played. What would say eighty minutes? I would say 80, 87 minutes of thirteen on thirteen football. And you're still dominating nearly every start. I mean, that's a that's a pretty bloody good series so far. Pretty good, pretty good, bloody good series. Um, all right, looking at the teams. 
Do you think that it's just business as usual for New South Wales? Just stick to what you know. You've dominated through the middle, the roll-ons, the offloads, the aggression. Or do you think anything changes heading into game three? No, I think they'll stick to a very similar game plan. I think that, uh, if anything, I reckon this is the field that probably suits us the most. Um, Last track? Yeah, I think so. Uh, like, it, it definitely suits you guys as well, no doubt about that. But I think that it, it definitely plays in the hands of the New South Wales Blues uh, and the way that we've played throughout this series. Um, so, mate, I don't really see them changing all that much. See, I reckon the fast track suits Queensland better. I'm with you. Yeah, I, th- I think For it suits sure. Queensland better because they've got a lot more speed um, than New South Wales, whereas the a thicker track, in, in my opinion, would probably suit the bigger, stronger, through the middle, just metres, post-contact, winning the contact... Um, in defence and attack. Timmy, what do you reckon, mate? Yeah, I think the slower surface, I mean, it's obviously quicker. I think a slower surface, certainly in Sydney, I know we got done in that game, but suits the Blues because we do play that power game through the middle, high percentage footy, you know, kick early, turn around, all that sort of stuff. I think the dry track, we, you know, look at the team picked by the Maroons. They are all out of attack. They'll use the ball. We spoke about it time time again but it's all about getting Reese Walsh at three on three he'll get it turned into a three on two and they'll look to outpoint us because their attack is so lethal so I think the I think the surface at Suncorp the conditions should be dry as it's perfectly suited to the Maroons which in other years granted you know obviously we don't have the best record up there when the Blues have had that really attacking expansive style of footy going back to sort of probably 2020 at least I think that has suited us the dry track but I think it's flipped this year mm. Rui? Thoughts? Yeah, I, I mean, I, as I said, it definitely does suit Queensland, but I, I don't think it like it doesn't suit New South Wales. I think in previous years, I've been petrified to go up there to a fast track. I think yep. that this we've got a team that can contend with Queensland on a fast track. Yeah, okay. which is the first time I felt like that probably since that 2020 series. Mm. Another key stat here: uh, so for New South Wales, their play this play the ball speed has been 3.4 seconds compared to Queensland's 3.71 seconds, which is like that's pretty substantial difference um just shows you how much new south wales are winning the contact like they are genuinely yeah i mean it's going to take a miracle uh in the middle there to be able to stop just they're just so big and then you bring on mitch barnett which is even more leg speed through the middle that the the play the ball speed through the middle is going to be very very tough to slow down i I suspect queensland will try and wrestle as much as they can in that first five minutes to see what the referee is going to do um very similar to penrith to the broncos uh in um, the grand final last year, first 20 minutes, heaps of wrestle just to see what the ref would do. Uh, then Broncos kind of realised it, started wrestling back, and, and then you saw Broncos get on top. Well, I think Kempi, I think Queensland hold the keys as to like, how this game will be played out. Do they stick with their, their all out attacking philosophy, philosophy, using the ball early, spreading it, or. Like, more notorious Queensland sides over the years, I, I particularly think of Wayne Bennett coach sides, have been that grindy side, get in the dog fight, complete early, let's just turn this into an arm wrestle. Do you think they they change their approach a little bit this for this game, or do you think they go, nah, we're going to outpoint them, we're, we've got too much attack for you? Oh, I, I just don't see Billy Slater, I don't think he has that in him. Yeah. Like, as a, as a player and as a coach, I, I think that Billy will just be looking at it like, we just have to complete. Like if we, we just have to not make errors coming out of our own end. I think Billy, the the mantra or the message heading out will probably be, guys, in our own 60, no errors. Mm. Like if you if we make errors, let's make it in their end. Whereas I think that they learnt over game one and two that no matter how good, they I mean how line breaks they can get coming out of their own end. If you give New South Wales field position, you will just be suffocated out of the game. Yeah, and I think the Ponga selection on the bench says to me, that's Billy going, no, 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 we're going to be too slick for you. Our ball playing, our speed is mm. going to be too much for you. Because although New South Wales have been, you know, so dominant and, and field position and we just read out all those stats, New Queensland have still found when they do uh, complete regularly, they can pick the New South Wales team apart. Mm. Like that second half, look, I know Q and the Rack kind of stuff, because they were ahead by so much. But then you could say, make the same argument for Queensland. Oh, well, that's what Queensland did in the first half because they knew they had game three. Their cue was in the rack. So kind of cancels each other out. Queensland came out and just like ball playing wise, going down short sides, a lot of line breaks. Um, so I, I think Billy's probably going into a stage. Guys, if we can just land around the... Because at the moment, completion rate, first game, uh, New South Wales completed 86%. Um, and then... Sorry, 
New South Wales have averaged 86% and Queensland have averaged 75%. And I just wonder if they were both at 85% each, I reckon Queensland probably win that battle mm. because they have the, the, the ball playing to pull them apart. The problem is, is that if you are a high, like attacking focused side and you take risks, your completion rate Broncos. is going to be late. Yeah, is going to be lower. It's the same as the Broncos. Yeah. So when it clicks, it's almost unsolvable. But yeah. that's the that's the whole that's a problem, is that risk it's be, hard to click. Risk be reward. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. If you're going to throw the ball around, you're going to drop it. So 100. percent So I wonder whether he's going to be like, look, let's let's rein it in coming out of our own end and just in our own 60 meter mark, like in our own 60 meters. Just no silly stuff. As soon as we get past that, whatever you want to do. And you're probably right, but at the same time, I see what Reese Walsh has done time and time again at all different levels of rugby league. Mm. And he attacks from his own end and he uses the ball. And because you get one bloke half a step out of place on the ki- on a kick chase and Reese Walsh exposes it. And he takes yeah. on because he's got that space to do it. Mm. Does it all the time for the Broncos. I know this is a different kettle of fish to, to NRL level, but he does his best work coming out of his own yeah. end. I mean, it's a, it's yeah, it's an all-in kind of play from Billy. Like if he does that, like he is back in the all-out attack. It's like a, it's a huge gamble, mm. you know. Rather than being a little bit more conservative, what do you reckon, right? Yeah, I agree. I think that for me, this is the first time in a few years, probably that as a New South Welshman, I've felt like okay, if you make mistakes in your end, I know we're going to execute off the back mm. of it. I know that we're going to turn it into points. Which, if I'm honest, I probably haven't felt that confident about that in the last few years. Uh, but mate, if I'm Billy Slater, I'm, I'm going all in. Mm. He's got the squad to do it. You've got Reese Walsh. You've got KP. You, you know what you're going to get out, out of Ches in, in this arena every single time. I'd I, I'd be backing them in to move the ball out of your own end. Just yep, yep. Okay, wing it. I mean, <laughs> I'm almost saying what I say with the Broncos all the time. I was like, I oh, just like I was reined it in a little bit. But Billy Slater, he built a career off attacking from anywhere. Like genuinely, mm. will attack from anywhere. And I I personally think if if you get in the grind with us, I mate. With our back five and with our forward pack, I, I reckon we can really give it to you, especially with our bench. See, I I, I want to get into a grind to a point. Like mm. That's why I always say in our own 60 or even own 50, like we'll bring it back a bit further. Own 50, get into that grind, and as soon as you cross that halfway point, and then implement the crazy ball playing, the slick ball playing, all that stuff. Because we have the, – the, the funny thing is, is we actually have the side – fitness wise and mobility wise to go with a high tempo game uh it's just it's the it's the winning of the contact that hurts us it's the them finding their front constantly the post contact meters what do you reckon hammy what do you reckon is going to happen yeah i just you, you kind of touched on the fact that new south wales particularly like through the middle and stuff have been a bit more damaging than queensland mm. in the first couple of games and like it's a bit more of a high risk style that queensland are probably set up to play but do you do you think that the the home sun Corp game three factor does that give the high risk footy a bit of a um, like a bit of a lift or a bit of a boost, or is it still high risk footy? Is high risk footy, and it might completely blow up, you know, with with the the fans at the back because they won their last three game three deciders. Uh, sorry, the last three game threes at SunCorp, Queensland. Um, so, you know, d- does that brand of footy maybe is it a bit is it a bit better playing it with, without it? Behind like it you? suits SunCorp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean. Yeah, because under Billy, they've only had one decider there. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, um, but I think you can downplay the kind of the boost that that kind of home crowd advantage. Yeah, for sure. Three kind of, I think a lot of people, because a lot of people that I've heard talking like you know New South Wales, you know they've got the win of their back after the last game, but it's a huge, huge factor. Suncorp game. Oh, three. absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we've kind of spoken about the negatives for Queensland, the negatives for New South Wales. We spoke about their swagger. Do you think they uh, have a have there's been a lot of chat, a lot of quotes. Do you think there's a concern of getting ahead of themselves? Uh, potentially. The bigger concern for me, mate, is that reality is you haven't played a good game of football yet. Mm. Mm. Oh, that, that's a much bigger concern for me that we, we get out there on Wednesday night and you go, oh, okay, fuck, okay, Queensland's going to play mm. tonight. Because mm. like, like, I personally think this has probably been the worst series I've seen from the Maroons so far. Mm. As a whole, like mm. they ha- they haven't they haven't looked like themselves at That's all. That's of two thousand twenty one, where we got fucking pumped. Yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. take out that. But like, <laughs> over the last few years, I I, I think this has been your, your two worst games you've probably played. Mm. Yeah, as much as I would have loved to have won game two fifty nil, 
deep down, I was happy to see the Maroons score three second half tries. I think mm. that takes a bit of complacency mm. out of it because I think they go into game three, the Blues, if they win 15, we'll go and we're too good for them. Like they, mm. they can't stay with us. But just those three tries go, no, 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 boys, like we're not indestructible. It was one good game, it was one good half of footy, essentially. Mm. I think that'll give them a reality check. Mate, they, we've lost a couple of series in a row. They can't afford to be complacent. They know that the Maroons haven't been at their best. I would be stunned if there's any complacency going into this game. Because the uh, concern is, is you've been here before. Like, uh, you know, you've won game two. And as I said, guys, we just spoke about the negatives. In Queensland is in devil's advocate. Now we're speaking devil's advocate for New South Wales. So it's just me posing the question. I don't mm. necessarily believe it's true. But you have been in this position many times before where you've had a huge game two and you've gone, fuck, all right, game one was just a, a blemish. We are a much better footy side. Then you get up to Suncop or you get to game three and it just all of a sudden looks like two different sides, two different teams. Mm. Could that happen again? You know, is, is that, do you feel there's something different about this series? Is, is it the send off in game one? Is it, is it this current playing group? Is it the coach? Do you think it's something? Oh, I don't think we go out there and get blown out like I think it's had in previous years. Mm. I think there has been times where we've gone at Suncorp and I've gone, fuck, I'm really confident here. I, I think we can get it done and we just get absolutely fucking wrestled by Queensland just doing mm. the same old stuff. I, I don't think we get blown away in this game by any means. Oh, I think we definitely compete with you for mm. sure. Because the Blues are playing that style of footy that is more more high percentage, I'm confident of the, the playing group we've got that we go out there and put in a big performance. I said, I, I just really feel like the Maroons have the keys to this. Do the Maroons click in attack? And if they do and everything sticks, and they're in cohesion and Ponga off the bench is a master stroke and he fits in well and slots into the attack nicely. That's what terrifies me. But the Blues side, I'm like, I go through it and I don't, really see any major chinks especially we took out the Maroons attack but defensively I think we've just picked a really good side so I'm confident that they're going to go out there and at the very least be in the fight I, I think when you look at all three games since the Wales it's the best 17 we've picked it's mm. the most well balanced 17 we've picked the entire series is that including not not with Latrell? Well, Latrell? Obviously, I'd ideally rather have Latrell, but I just think the bench makeup, uh, bringing in a guy like Mitch Barnett, I think you know you've got Cam Murray in there as well. I just think it's a very well balanced side. Yeah. So you think like Barnett kind of makes up not for the loss of Latrell, but like if you were comparing the two sides, yeah, you would have this just above just because of the Barnett on the bench over Olakwatu. Yeah, and it, it just helps the Barnett can play multiple positions at, at a high click there, whereas Olakwatu, like I, I was fine with him being in there and I was happy with it, but he didn't quite have the impact that I thought he would. <laughs> Granted, some weird games he had to come into there. Very strange games. For Very him. strange, I don't yeah. think he was used the best, but I also think that I don't think Madge expected his edge back roles to be so good like they've been yes you could argue martin and Cry uh, crichton have been your two best players yeah and, and because they have been so good i think it makes more sense to go with him i felt terrible for lakawati he doesn't mm. deserve to get dropped but i think it makes more sense to have mitchy there mm. if we look at playing devil's advocate uh, we've spoken so much this series one of the most fascinating things this series has been the bench makeup of both teams each and every game and i'm really happy with the blues bench makeup but if we're talking about concerns you know if it, if an Backline player does go down and Connor Watson does find himself defending at centre. Scares the shit out of me. Yeah. Because I think he can do a job there, but he is a middle forward these days that will be defending at centre with Reese Walsh coming at him, with Caelan Pong coming at him, Val Holmes, Hamiso Tabiofito. Just ruthless, mm. relentless speed. That scares me. Yeah. So he can do a job, but he's not an out and out outside back, is he? Yeah. Do you think if a centre goes down, it would be Connor Watson immediately there? Do you, do you think there's a chance that Probably would go Murray, Murray or reckon, an Angus? Or I reckon someone? Murray gets pushed out there. Yeah, I, I think I'd do that before I put mm. Watson there. And put personally. Connor in the middle? Yeah. I don't love it, as in I don't love yeah. Cam Murray getting moved out, but yeah. just because he's he's defended there a little bit. I know Connor Watson played one game there, but you know Murray has played a few games at centre, and he, I'd just be like looking at him at out-and-out defence, like, mate, just defend yeah. your ass off out there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I get both views for sure. Mm. I think I'd go with Connor Watson. Like he's a bloke who has uh, spent a lot of time playing out five eight, defending at three men. Yep. He's played not really helped defensively, but fullback. I as nimble as Cam Murray is, I do think Connor Watson, who is a good defender, a bit more agile, a bit more lateral. I would prefer him at centre, mm. but I, I get it. Yeah, it's a tough one because if you if you got blokes, I mean he has played six and seven. I guess just out in Origin, getting that you know wide ball. Mm. 
and a big centre running hard lines. I just wonder, does he, with that extra space around Connor Watson, does he get dom- like dominated in every single tackle? But then you'd say, well, if he doesn't get dominated in the middle, why would he get dom- like dominated fine, out, out on the edge? And they're not big centres either, like Gagai, uh, Hammer. Hammer's obviously speed. Gagai, I'm just trying to think know. like, Gagai fending Murray would be a harder job than fending Connor Watson. Mm. But then obviously Watson is quicker than Murray. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's, it's physicality over speed really that you're probably I, I think go. it sort of depends which centre they had to mark yeah. for me, the more I think about it. Because if it's Holmes, it's speed you want out there to be able to catch him. Oh, sorry, it's not Holmes, buddy. Um, Hamiso. Hamiso. Yeah. You probably want speed. I don't want Cam Murray on Hammer. That, yeah. that scares yeah. the shit out of me. Cam, Whereas, Murray on, Cam Murray on Dane Gagai, I'm more than happy yeah. with that. Yeah, yeah. I probably want Cam Murray and Gagai because of the because he's all contact and, and yeah, which which is the beauty of having Stephen Crichton now. There too, he can play both sides. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean the beauty, yeah, the beauty of Critter is like if you've got one edge that's like leaking a few line breaks, boom, straight across. Yeah. He'll sort. It's just like you'll know he'll sort it. You just go, yeah, it'll be sweet. We'll just put Critter there. Um, and it's interesting because he, you know, we spoke about it a few years ago with a guy like Critter. His defense was an issue a few years ago, and he actually has come out and he said he had a game against. The eels where Wunga Blake just put it on him, and he he said I saw the replay and I would never I said I'll never let that happen again. I'm never going to let that happen again. And he said he worked on his defence ever since then. And buddy, I will say you can he he when he gets caught in those two minds of like that intercept body shape and the defensive body shape, he can get found out a little bit. Uh, I think there was one in game one where he kind of got caught in the two minds of doing it. He ended up getting an intercept later in the game. I think with Critter. I mean, look, he's the best defensive center, so he can do what he wants to do. But I would be almost of the mind, listen, for the first X amount of minutes, don't even think intercept. Just think defend, defend, defend. Then if we need the intercept, start thinking that mindset. He's, he's the best defensive center probably in the game now, but I just said, mate, 18 months ago, maybe two years ago, he wasn't. Like, mm. he had poor reads. He, he was way too inclined to go for the intercept. Mm. I really do think he's gotten that out of his game. Like, when the opportunity presents itself, he'll go for it. But first job is always defence. If the opportunity arrives where the intercept pops up, he'll go for it. But he got one, sorry, game two, I think he got one. I'm not saying he's not going to get him, yeah, but yeah. like... No, de- no, no, defense, I'm just yeah, remembering. Yeah, 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 sorry. I'm, I'm confident he's got that intercept first mentality out of his game. I don't think I've really seen that for, for two years. Yeah, I completely agree. I, I feel like well, watching him with the dogs now, he's just, he's just locked in all the time. Yeah, I've seen a few times where he's like... You can see he's hesitated, hesitated, mm. and he's he's outside. He man. wants it. He, he wants yeah, it. He doesn't go for it. But again, yeah. I'm being like, guys, hyper hyper critical here. Mm. Talking about this New South Wales side is pretty hard to talk about because they've been so good game one and two. Unless we be hyper critical, there's re- like really there's not much to talk mm. about. They've been outstanding in defence, outstanding in attack. Obviously, game one, the, their biggest probably letdown was maybe their kicking game, um, whereas that's all been sorted yep. with Mitchell Moses. Um, okay, in regards to the Queensland side. I guess, should they be, do you think they're feeling, because like they're in this weird spot where New South Wales came into this series as underdogs and they've kind of really used that underdog tag well this series. And so now Queensland are in this weird spot where they're favourites, but they haven't played much good footy. So they can't really say they're out and out underdogs because they're actually favourites. But at the same time, they haven't played any good footy. So it's a weird spot to be I've in. I've never really seen Queensland in a spot like this. It's just bizarre. Yeah. Like It's a very strange spot to be in for the for Queensland. They're going to love it. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, you know, favourites on paper, but coming off the, the big loss, they're going to sweet. Boys, we've got these guys covered. Mm. Like, how explosive we are, the amount of points we've got in us. I think they're exactly where they want to be. See, I don't, I don't want them thinking like that. Yeah, yeah. I don't want them thinking like, we're sweet. Like, we've got, look how explosive mm. we are. We've got points in us. We're going to sort Because I think that's been their undoing in mm. game one and two of always going you know we'll, we'll get the points when we need them but even like in the pack where we, we were quite dominant in game two i think their pack and we sitting there on well it's an off night boys we'll be all right everyone's saying they're more explosive for us they've got more legs being us mm. i think paddy carrig and reuben cottage in there no, no no look we'll be right yeah cannot wait okay on the bench when does calen ponga come on do you think have, have we gotten closer to knowing oh, i'm still pretty confident he comes on at the 30 minute mark I think it'll be around the 30. Yeah. I just, and then you've said six, around the 60 minute mark. I just think, like, mate, him on the bench for that long, I don't, I want him out there. Yeah. Depending well, on the, it's how, it's the game depend goes. Depending on how the game yeah, plays. If you find yourself behind early, <clears> if <throat> you go down, you cut the tries by 25, 30 minutes, yeah, you'll get him out there because you need to start thinking points. Mm. 
I just think it's going to be a grind early, that mm. first half. And I think the game's going to be tight. And I think 50 to 55 minutes he comes on. I'm not shocked if he comes on after 30, but I yep. think if it is an arm wrestle, which I do, I reckon he comes on about the 55-minute mark. The reality is he's coming back into origin football off the back of one game in a pretty – he had a pretty lengthy stint out. It's, it's a lot. Mm. And yeah. he's also coming back in a position that's not familiar to him. He's, we think he's going to come on and play a sort of a roaming, almost like a lock, and just in and around the ruck. Mm. He's going to be making tackles through the middle. It's a big ask. Oh, it's massive. It, it's, you know, we're, we're believing it because it's Kalen Ponga, mm. but if it was anyone just a tier below KP, we'd be saying, mate, he's barely played any footy in like, what is it, it's eight weeks or something like Which that? Which more so to the point, if it was anyone but Kalen, they're probably not there in the first place. Yeah, true, true. Um, he played, he's played one game. Since round seven. Crazy. It's a freaking long time. So to ask him to come out, and look, I'm sure he can do two short stints in this game, but the second those minutes creep up and he's defending in the middle, mm. it's a huge ask. Especially with such a big forward pack and outside backs yeah. New South Wales side. Like, it's honestly nightmare after nightmare it's coming out of their own end. How big Put it this way, he comes on 30th minute. Guess who else comes on at that time? Spencer, yeah, Spencer Lenny. Lenny. And yep. he, he has to tackle Spencer Lenny through the middle three times. Ugh. How's Caelan Ponga looking? I mean, so, even our forwards couldn't tackle him, yeah. so... Um, Trent Leora, 18th man. I know he's 18th man, but that's a huge vote of confidence from Billy Slater to go debutant as the 18th man. If, if shit hits the fan, we're going to pull a debutant 18th, 18th man. Big ask, isn't it? That's like, Trent Leora has been, you know, he's a battler, he's had a good solid year, but like, it's not like he's been jumping out of his skin to be selected. The confidence... I tell you what, Melbourne, you should be stoked with this because the confidence he's going to have coming back to Clubland is going to be through the roof. But it's a huge play. And that's the one thing. Like, to me, you know, it's a huge play and I, it's surprised me a little bit. But just because Billy's got, you know, such a strong connection to those Melbourne Storm boys, he would know Trent pretty well. I just... <laughs> I'm pretty confident there's more to Trent than what I know of right now. Yeah, oh, Slater's sure. made this decision, you know. I've got a feeling that if you watched him closely... He does all the one percenters perfectly. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Because it's because it's not like his flashiness isn't the reason why he's there. It's because he's a battler. He gets through a bunch of work. Because I I do notice he gets through a bunch of work. I do notice that, but I don't watch him close enough to go like, what's his time like in defence? What's his wrestle? It's all the little things. Like, if you ever want to watch, like all the little things, watch Fisher Harris and Leota every tackle, and I mean in defence, their wrestle is perfect. They hold on for just the right amount of time. Like. When they go to ground, a lot of lazier players, I'm saying air quotation, lazier players, they go to ground, oh, job's done, and then they kind of get up. Whereas you watch Leota and Fisher Harris, they're getting every second they're in contact with someone, they're working towards something. It's, there's never a wasted second. Um, I mean, you can watch all those Penrith boys. Like, they, they never switch off. There's never a second where they're like, okay, job's done. Um, and I'm, I'm assuming Trent Leora is, is similar, of the similar ilk where he's doing all those tiny little things really well. Well... Tackle efficiency for the Storm this year of 94.6%, which ties right into that. Mm. It's, it's a funny one, yeah. Also, in a side that scored a lot of points this year in Melbourne, he doesn't have a line break, he doesn't have a line assist. Don't get me wrong, he's not there to be an attacking yeah. player and doesn't need to be in the Storm, but it's a very specific type of player that's come in. Yeah. Um, I know team say since the last week, but it just reaffirmed it to me on the weekend. So surprised this isn't Bo Fermor, as 18th man. Yeah. With his versatility. It must be. I just look at it and you go, you've got Catewell, uh, Kafusi, and Lioro as like your three kind of, fringe is the wrong word, but guys that, you know, may or may not have been selected. But what are their, all of their best traits is their defence. I think yeah. Billy is just going, you know what, I've got enough attack through this side. I'm bringing in the best possible defenders I Wanting can. Wanting more of a, not that he's a big boy, Loyero, but uh, more of a middle forward if the 18th man is activated. Yep. So they're relatively covered in the outside, or the entire back line with, with Ponga there. You know, Kate can play centre if needed. Probably just thinking, if it's needed, we need a middle forward, hence Loyero. Just get in and do a job, yep. like defensively, because we've got enough attacking weapons out wide. Which to, is, which is yeah. fair, because yeah. as I said, points shouldn't be an issue for this team. Nah. <laughs> Makes a lot more sense when you put it that way, because mm -hmm. like, they have got so much first time. Yeah. Oh, man. Oh, man. All right, boys. Predictions. Predictions. Um, I'm going Hamiso anytime. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a huge one. <laughs> Queensland, head to head to win. <laughs> and Paddy Carrigan, man of the match. Yeah. That's what I'm going. Might as well throw a man of the series in as well. Yeah, it gives a Wally Lewis. Okay. Lewis. Well. Lewis medal. How, it's just, 
it's as a Queenslander, I, it's it's such a kick in the dick to Union New South Welshman that the player of the series is called a Wally Lewis medal. Medal. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it hurts. <laughs> Surely it's a joint. It should be a joint. The should Lewis joint. John's medal. I'll, I'm, I'll pay it though. No, I'll no, the, actually, the Lewis Kenny medal. Lewis Kenny, Lewis Johns. Lewis Johns. What has the best ring to it? We call the GI medal. It's from New South Wales. Ooh, <laughs> oh, wow. Low blow. What about the Sterling medal? He's from Queensland. GI yeah. fits. I like okay. it. No, nah, <laughs> uh, I'm going to go the Blues by. Four, I'm going to go, what do I need? A try scorer in MLM. Yeah. Try scorer, uh, I'm going to go for Liam Martin to score. MOM here, I'm going to go Cam Murray. And player of the series, tough. Um, do you reckon Moses can do it off two games? Yep. Yeah, for sure, yeah. for sure. Definitely. Um Actually, you know what? I'm going to go Payne Haas. 13 bucks. Payne Haas. That's a good game up there. Yep. Blues win. Edwards, man of the match. Angus Crichton, any time try. Angus Crichton, man of series. Best back man of the series, Angus Crichton, at $9. Wow. Wow. Far out. Oh, right. I'll go Blues to win. I just, I don't, I'm not vibing any try scorers from Blues like that jumped out to me, so I'm just <laughs> going to go with Hammer for Queensland. I'll go Moses, man of the match, and Moses, man of the series. Was Moses that a scared to mess around with Juju? Sorry? Try scorer bet there or? Uh, no. no. If you really want to know, I was on sports bet scrolling yesterday, walking with Courtney in the park, and we saw a hammer on the ground. And we were, ta- <laughs> <laughs> and we were talking oh. about it. So, yeah, that was it for me. Big juju guy. Was that a juju thing? No. <laughs> we saw a hammer on the ground. <laughs> oh, oh, well, I haven't got quite got a reason that good for my okay. try yep. Uh I got Queensland, I think, in a, in a tight one. Mm. Queensland 1 to 12, those sort of areas. Origin Gagai, big fan of him. Just Ooh, for a try. Okay, okay. I think he's got Ooh, a meat okay. pie in him. I reckon uh, Benny Hunt, man of the match. Okay. And the do- I'm just going to go with the dozer again. I do like Angus Crichton, but that would probably mean that New South Wales would have to win the series. We're, we're avoiding that. Benny Hunt, man of the series. The dozer, 17 bucks in the Wally Lewis medal as well. Uh, 2018, Hammy, Billy Slater won the Wally Lewis medal, and Teddy and Blues won the series. So it, c- it can be done. It can be done. Very rare. I'm, yep. Look, Play the series, it's a tough one because New Queensland have played so poorly. Um, I said Paddy Carrigan, man of the match, but if we win player of the series, because I haven't given my player of the series yet, I'll just go DCE. Yeah, he's the favourite, $2.70. Oh, well, there you go. DC is $2.70. Correct. Player of the series. Man yeah. of the match in game one, I believe. Yep. yep. Wow. That's, uh, that's crazy about Angus Crichton being $9. He's a second row that hasn't scored a trial. Yeah, I know. He's just been so damaging. Every yeah. time the ball goes out there, it's mm. carnage. Like there's bodies flying everywhere, yeah. there's offloads, there's quick play of the balls, absolute carnage. What's Mitch Moses at? 5.20. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Just yeah. a fun fact, both times Blues have won in Suncorp, a, a decider, it's been the halfback's last origin game. Yeah. DCE, okay, there we go. There's the vibe check. DCA. Oh, sorry, for, for, um, for New South Wales. Oh. <laughs> just one last one, Jerome Law. Jerome Lewis, 21 bucks. Bit of value there, because he's been Heaps of value. Good. He's been great. Yeah, he's been really good. Um, all righty, that is the Origin Chat done and doosted. All righty, before we get to Team of the Week, don't forget, guys, in the show notes, there will be a link to a survey. It just asks you questions about your favourite segment, all that stuff. We are giving away $1,000 cash in total, so two $500 cash prizes to two random people that fill this out. Guys, I can't express enough how much it helps uh, us and the platform, helps us grow by doing the survey. Take you two seconds, and I really appreciate it. Uh, usually, out of the listeners, there might be about 1% of listeners, not even 1% actually. Uh, actually yeah, maybe 1% of listeners actually fill the survey out. Let's get that to 3%. Could we get 3% of your listeners to fill it out? It'd be incredibly grateful, guys. Plus, you have a chance to win $500. Also, just got the news. Mitchell Pierce will be joining us for Game 3 Decider on YouTube. As soon as the Game 3 Decider finishes, Mitchell Pierce will be with us doing a live YouTube show reviewing the whole series and the series winner. Let's get into it. Bloke Beer Team of the Week at number one, Tommy Turbo. I'm still confused at what's happening there in regards to will he be one when Cooler gets back or whatever. Uh, but... He looked much better than he did last week, and it's good to see Turbo back on the field playing some great footy. At number two, Hopawadi. Wow, he was outstanding. Three, Ramian. I'll tell you what, when we talk about underrated performances or forms for the season, Ramian has to be up there with probably, 
in the top three at least, underrated performers this year. I think if you have a look at the last eight weeks, he's averaging like 180 metres from centre and he's had like two line breaks. It's Mate. wild. He's been so, so good. Uh, at four, Ruben Garrick. He was outstanding on the weekend. At five, Mulatalo. Had a bit of a dip in form, but he's back to his best. Uh, at six, Jaden Campbell. Holy, I tell you what. What, he, what I liked the most about it was his big shot that dislodged the ball. Um, who was it that ran back? It was, I think it was a rookie for the Parry Eels. Picked out the little fella. He said, ah, not today, baby. Not today. Uh, at seven, Trindle steps up in the ab- absence of Hines. At eight, Tavita Pangai Jr. delivering what he was brought to the club for. At nine, Little from the Dragons. At ten, Regan Campbell-Gillard. He honestly could not have done more. I wonder whether he's had a conversation with Riles and Riles has said to him, mate, I need you to do this, this and this because he was outstanding. I tell you what, if RCG and Paolo stay at the club, you know, going forward, and there's no reason as to why they wouldn't, them under Riles, that's a good tutelage. That's a bloody good tutelage. Um, okay, at number 11 and 12, we got Sua and Nikoda. What about the line Nikoda ran to score that try? Holy shit. Uh, at 13, Nathan Brown, bargain by the season, do we all agree? Oh, yeah. 100%. Lock it in, bargain by the Brown. season. Yeah. At 14, Katoa, Isaiah Katoa from the Dolphins. 15, McInnes, 16, Randall from the Titans, and 17, Bostock on the wing. That's uh, your bloke beer team of the week. Get in your local, grab a case of bloke beer. It's beer for blokes that turn up for family, mates, and good times. A beautiful, easy drinking lager, Aussie spirit in a can. It's the beer of rugby league, guys. Give her a crack. All right, let's get on to Menu Logs' hungriest player. Menu Logs' hungriest player this week is it's Lehigh Hopperwadi. That is right. The winger, well, he was fullback. He got put on the wing. He played even better footy on the wing. What about the try assist that he set up for his inside man, uh, Talau? Uh, look, Hopperwadi, he has been, I don't know if he's in find of the season yet, but when he was that far down in the pecking order to get a start, got a start at fullback, he played. He played good, even really good at times. But on the weekend, he was great. And the exciting thing for Manly is is that obviously you want Tom Trebojevic fully fit and firing. Everything goes really well. But the exciting thing is you've got this young guy that's a teenager. He's just a teenager still? I think so, yeah. Can you check for me, Matty? You've got this young guy as a teenager still with a skill set like that, with his ability to make metres, with good ball playing, with good footwork. I mean, very exciting for the club. And on the weekend, he was absolutely phenomenal. And it wasn't just the, the nice touches. Because, like, if you've got the last name Hopawadi, you can almost guarantee you've got all the, <laughs> the flary stuff in rugby league. You can guarantee it. It was his ability to get through a bunch of work that I was really, really excited about. I thought Hopawadi was fantastic. Use code Hopawadi, H-O-P-O-A-T-E. Hey, it's got eight in it. That's a, that's a bit of poetic justice there. <laughs> Also as well, I think it was uh, his brother okay. down in the nation's capital. I he liked burned it. himself making dinner a few what? weeks ago, couldn't he? He did, yeah. He could do a bit of menu log. Yeah. Wouldn't go Abs- astray. Absolutely. He's Abs- 19, by the way. 19 years old. Uh, so use Hopawadi, $7 off your order. Uh, minimum order is $15. I think KFC is excluded. Oh, yeah. um, cop hat, Colonel. Yeah, cop that. Cop, no, I think they're the ones that copping us. They're the ones that put yeah. excluded. I think so anyway. But anyway, you, it, all other foods. <laughs> Use code Hopper Whitey for seven dollars off. What do you think of Whitey's performance on the weekend? I mean, he took the opportunity with both hands, didn't he? Granted, like the, the Knights' edge defence was, uh, or the team in general was a little bit depleted out wide, but he was on Dylan Lucas's and um, who was the winger outside? Mapalangi. Mm. Sorry, Mapalangi. Um, how about the fullback stocks at Manly right now? Mm. Like he, he wasn't meant to be playing this game, Leo Hopper Whitey. <laughs> if Tolatel Cola was available. I'm not sure if Hopawati is in this team. Well, he might have carried him on the bench because he carried a bench. He carried, he carried him it back on the bench. Yeah. Far, lo- far logo? Far, uh, far longo? Yeah. On the bench. But far logo. Like, between their fullback options, Tommy Turbo, Cola, Leo Hopawati, Ruben Garrick, like outside Tommy Turbo, they're three blokes that would start at fullback at a fair few NRL clubs. Mm. Not a bad spot to be in. Mate, he was so good on the weekend. Not to mention the fellow that came off the bench, Clayton, I think he scored 29 tries in reserve grade last year and can play fullback. Yeah. He, oh, I think he's yeah. the last 2023 and 24, he's got like 40 something tries. He's the most in, in New South Wales Cup. He was uh, Ella's could be anything for the Manly Seagulls. Oh, this was year. he? Yeah. Okay. Was Hopperwadi or the other fellow? Clayton. Clayton. Came off the bench, yeah. Um, but yeah, anyway, Hopperwadi was absolutely phenomenal and. This is how good he is now. He, he's a 
he's not a big kid, so once he fills his frame out, I cannot wait to see what mm. he turns into. I cannot wait. And you know, you got Tommy Talao as well, also playing career best footy. I think he's leading their try scored for the season as well. So their outside backs are looking substantially better than at the start of the year. At the start of the year, almost looking at going, oh, I don't know about the depth that the, the Manly Seagulls, now you're sitting there going, they've got too many outside Tommy, backs. Tommy Chwobich back and firing. All of a sudden, there's a few shades of 2021 about the Manly Warringah Seagulls. It could go on a run if he's, look, if his body is in good nick and he can get to full speed and, you know, get through as much work as we know he can, who says they can't go on a run? Put got DC in good form. Put it this way, points are not going to be an issue. Nah, no way. No way. Especially... You know, the really good thing for Manly Seagulls is you've got multiple players like Tommy Talao, Hopawati, uh, playing like some of the best footy that they've played. Like, mm. I, I highly doubt they expected Hopawati to be this far ahead of schedule mm. to come on and do what he did. So much so that he's putting pressure on... I mean, you'd have Kula straight back in there, but you'd have to say he's putting pressure on Tommy, probably Tommy Talao, even though Tommy Talao is playing uh, really good footy. So them at full strength, <sighs> like... You've got a guy like Lehigh Hopawati who might be sitting at 14 on the bench or something like that. So really, really good stuff from Manly Seagulls. They can be up and down, but at the end of the day, when they're on, they are on on. They are tough, tough to spot. So uh, Hopawati, use code Hopawati for $7 off your... Uh, Clayton uh, Falalo, uh, apologies if I got that wrong, but he's in the last two years, or last year and a half in reserve grade, he's scored 41 tries, <laughs> made 40 line breaks, but he's also set up 18 tries himself. So most, and most of the games has been on the wing. Yeah, I think I remember watching him in the trials and I was like, I think there's something about that guy. Like just the way he moved, he looked very sure of himself, strong in contact. And yeah, and he's not even going to be in the 17 and they're strongest. Well, he's he moved to fullback about five or six weeks ago in reserve grade. He scored seven tries in five games, including four against the Magpies a few weeks ago. Yeah. I was short on a fullback. That's really, really good signs for the Manly Seagulls. <laughs> um, it's going to be interesting to see what they do with uh, Tommy Turbo. You know, when Cooler gets back, do they just keep him there? Does he stays. He stays? He has to. I mean, they've made that. I mean, we'll get to it when the Manly game comes up because it is it is a bit confusing. So I'd love to get your thoughts on what's the go there for Manly. Um, as I said, guys, Hopper Whitey, $7 off. Round 19 review. Let's get into it, shall we? Dolphins, 36 to the Rabbitohs, 28. Uh, man, the Dolphins... This is exactly what they needed. Granted, yes, was it against the Rabbitoh side without Latrell Mitchell and, you know, they're not a top-tier side currently. At the end of the day, they get the job done. Um, I thought Isaiah Cattell was phenomenal. Uh, I thought Bostock on the wing was phenomenal. Herbie was great. Uh, they are just, they're just keeping in touch with the top eight. They're keeping in touch even potentially with the top four if they go on a crazy run. They're going so well that you know, they're only a win outside the top four right now. So they've got 24 points. Um, oh, granted, they've got a game in hand. Fuck, I hate this game in hand. Shit. <laughs> so much. Um, so they're basically two wins outside the four. So it's going to be tough to make the four, but uh, they're sitting in number six. They've got 16 games, 24 wins, um, and their points differential is 65, uh, which is which is decent, but not great. Uh I tell you what, at the moment, you probably say they're going to make the A. Yeah, I, I tell you what. Before this game, I was getting a little bit nervous for them because they sort of ha had a little bit of a slump. They've got a few. They needed this whatnot. for sure. Like they, they needed, needed a win top. desperately. Yeah, and I mean, you know, yeah, it, it, it's a good win against South Sydney. I think you know, I, I, I sort of didn't think too much about it until after the game. But obviously, goal kicking played a huge role in this too. Saka kicked six, six from six. Mm. South Sydney Rabbit has only put together two from six, so it was six tries apiece. Um, yeah, I'd like to think they'll be in the eight. I hope they are, but I'm not totally convinced at the moment. They have a savage run home, mm. so no buys to come. They go on, they run home. Panthers away this week, crossing their fingers and toes. If they can rest a few players, Penrith, they can jag another one there, but we'll see how that plays out. Panthers, Titans, Roosters, Warriors, Bulldogs, Storm, Broncos, Knights, finishing the season, Knights in Newcastle. So it is a very difficult draw, but... Look, they've given themselves every opportunity to be in the fight for it. Well, Warriors, Broncos, Knights, they can beat all three of those players. Like, Broncos are not a top tier side. Mate, the Dolphins have shown yeah. they can beat most teams on their day. Like, mm. the only game there that's not winnable for them is, like, Penrith in Penrith, if Penrith are full strength. But yeah. I don't know that. I think Penrith will probably rest players after this. 
they can beat anyone, but as far as draws go, it's damn tough. Like Brisbane's, I mean, it's at Sun Court, that doesn't change much, does it? Stormer away, um, yeah, it's tough. Even those Warriors and Brisbane game, the games they should win, but th- those teams are playing for their season. Oh, yeah. Look, I'm not locking them into my eight, but I, I think they've put themselves in a really good position to make the eight in the second year of... Uh, like, I heading into those games, who are you more sure that's going to turn up? Dolphins, Warriors or Broncos? Yeah, Dolphins, for sure. You know, yeah. and I think that's a that's a testament to a side that, you know, if Warriors and Dolph- Warriors and Broncos want to say, oh, we've had all the injuries, so are the Dolphins. So are the Dolphins. Yeah. And yet that's a testament to the side that we're all sitting here going... It's we're getting into the business end of the season and we're more confident the Dolphins are going to turn up mm. and put together 80 minutes of footy than the Warriors and the Broncos, who were juggernauts last year. What's been so yeah, intriguing about the Dolphins is just like, I expected them again under Wayne Bennett to be this tough, gritty team, defensive, like really sound. Their defence hasn't been great, but their attack has mm. been. And look, when you've got halves of Cody Nikarima, Nikarima and Isaiah Katoa with either Trey Fuller or Hamiso Tabio Fido at the back, there's going to be points, isn't yeah. there? I'd, I'd have to say, I I think the score is a little bit flattering to the Rabbitohs. I think the Dolphins kind of put the cue in the rack the last 10 or so minutes. Um, they were winning, I think, by like, would have been, what was it? So they got ahead. Oh my God, let's get a summary. Yeah, so they got ahead in the 69th minute. I think they were ahead by like, I think it was 36 18. Yeah, so that were like, it was done. Mm. It was all done. And then there was two late tries in the 74th and the 79th minute for the Rabbitohs. And look, granted, they still scored those points, the Rabbitohs, but I did feel like probably the last 20, 30 minutes, the, the, the Dolphins had the, the game sorted, um, which is like pretty impressive. When you look at the stats, for them to score as many points as they did, they made 13 errors. 13 errors compared to the Rabbitohs' four. Wow. And they, they scored friggin' 36 points, to your point. Um, so really, really good win for the, the Dolphins. And it's just a testament to – it doesn't matter. like well, Obviously, it does matter to an extent what your roster is. But we are watching much better rosters on paper struggle to put 80 minutes together. You look at the Broncos, you look at the Warriors, and you look at the Dolphins. And it's just the culture that Wayne seems to build. Like this, this – doesn't matter who you are, you're just going to fight for everything – and they find themselves, like, um, imagine a world where we could be sitting at the end of the season, Broncos miss the eight and Warriors miss the eight, Dolphins are in the eight. For the, wouldn't that be something? Dolphins make the eight, Incredible. Broncos miss it, second year into their NRL era. It'd be remarkable. That's what I mean. That's, and that's the, that's the path that we're heading down yeah. at the moment. Like, they're getting the job done, they're sitting in the eight, and granted, I wouldn't like, I'm not locking them into my eight, but they're, they're fighting, and they keep turning up, and they keep getting the wins when they need to. Um, in regards to performances, hasn't Bostock just taken another level this year? He's the most improved player in the competition, I think. When you have a look at him last year, like even just eyeballing him last year, but I don't know, you guys felt, but I just just looking at him, I thought his body's not ready for the NRL. And then mate, he's put on so much size this year, he seemingly hasn't lost any pace, and he's just he's just confident in himself. It's, a, it's such a Wayne job that's happened yep. here. Like, by he gives him his debut, and if you could all watch his debut, he didn't take a backward step, but he got beaten up. He got bashed yeah. up. Wayne's gone, oh, shit, way too soon for this young fella. And there were guys that were getting starts last year. We were going, I think Bostock's probably a better player at this stage. But Wayne just said, look, this guy's just nowhere near ready for first grade. Beast patient with him, has another whole full preseason with him, comes back out. And, like, the level of improvement compared to his debut to what you watch now is a com- not the complete package, but improved package. It's, it's genuinely night and day. 12 tries in 14 games this year for Jack Bostock. Very impressive. He, honestly, he reminds me a lot of Campbell Graham. He really does. Like, yeah, he, early he, days on the wing. Yeah, big on tall, the wing. Fella. Big tall fella. Doesn't take a backward step. Takes a tough mm. carries, but also can score a point. Score points. Great call. I was going to bring it up later, but now that you've mentioned him, uh, I watched this game at the Newmarket Hotel around the corner, and I know a lot of people, I see it on social media all the time, blowing up about players not caring about results and stuff. Campbell Graham was there as well watching his oh, team really? play, and fuck, there's a bloke that cares about his footy Man. side. You did, mate, you just got to watch him play to show how much he cares. Yeah. The fact that he played essentially the whole year with a cracked sternum last year, mm. that's insane. That's insane. You know how painful every single time you make contact, you're in pain. Yeah, and Campbell Graham, he rode every single moment of that on the edge of his seat, and as soon as the full-time siren went at South Lost, head down, walked straight out. He was filthy. Yeah. It's really good to see. It's yeah, great. absolutely. Abs- that's, I mean, that's why Rabideau's fans, he's probably one of the favourite players, seriously. Yeah. 
They love you, him. Do you get your autograph on the way out? Yeah, I told him to fuck off. You know? <laughs> <laughs> get away from me, kid. Oh, wow, holy <laughs> shit. No, I'm a big Campbell Graham guy. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Um, hey, just on Bostock, he has uh, improved heaps, gotten a lot bigger um, as well. Watching that game, I was like, oh, geez, I reckon he's not – he couldn't be that far away. Uh, potentially another good year and then in, in Origin, in the Origin frame. Did a bit of a Google, shattered to find out he's a New South Welshman. Ooh, that Took hurts. me by surprise. That hurts. And yeah. he's pledged to New South Wales and everything? Yeah, I think he's played New South Wales 19. Uh, yeah, and yeah. He, yeah, his, um, his sister carved up New South Wales 19's last week oh, okay. too. So, yeah. yeah he'll, uh, uh, damn it. Proud New South Welshman. Yep. Damn it. Um, okay, I want to talk about Trey Fuller. Trey Fuller. How hasn't this bloke been playing in a row for the last 10 years? I, I was told a few weeks ago, and do your own research on this, that he's been offered a contract to go join clubs a few times. He just loves his lifestyle up there. So any of this and it just happens Redcliffe. to be an NRL team landed there. No way. Because I, I heard the same mail that he absolutely frosts Redcliffe as a club. Yeah. Like he loves Redcliffe as a club. If that is true, as a Dolphins fan, you must be sitting there going, like, that's godsend. That's genuinely one in a million. Yep. Tell me another player wow. that would ever do that. That's just, remarkable. Just happens to be an NRL club landed in his street. Unbelievable. Oh, yeah. Off contract next year, I believe. I, I, think, I think the so, Dolphins yeah. are trying to sort something out as we speak. Um, and this could be wrong, but I've looked a couple of times. I don't think he's technically in their top 30 because he's not listed on the website. And he hasn't, and he hasn't been. He probably, well, he probably I reckon wasn't. you're right because he... He played around like around nine or ten or something, and there's that the cutoff is about around eleven or twelve where you can play players from outside your top twenty-five or thirty, whatever it is. Cause there was a week there where I don't think he could actually play after debuting. That's right, that's right. Yeah, he, it was like played round ten or something, then couldn't play round eleven because of it, then the tick over happened round twelve, whatever the week was, and he was back in. Yeah, he couldn't play earlier in the year. That's mm. that is right. Yeah, so he's on the top thirty. As as one of his um coaches coming through said that uh, everyone just said he was too small. Kept saying, even when he was making all the rep sizes and that, no, nah, just too small. You know, we've spoken about it, uh, but any young fella or young girl that's listening, the, if you still believe the nonsense about being too small in today's game, like, it's utter bullshit. There is no such thing as too small, especially in today's game. I mean, look at Jai Gray. How, he would be, what's he, 5'6"? He's tiny. Um, and li- and- literally look at the four Queensland clubs. Drinkwater, not much size about him. Mm. Reese Walsh, not a lot of size about him. Uh, Trey Fuller, tiny. Keanu Kinney, who's been killing it, tiny. Yeah. Kinney oh, I, I, I was at the South game the last week watching Jai Gray play reserve grade. Even I heard it. I, yeah. Not bad. You need a mini? <laughs> no. I'm here all day. <laughs> <laughs> Even just watching Jai Gray play reserve grade, like when you, when you first look at the field and you see him out there, like it, it's almost like, comical how much smaller he is than everyone else but he just plays tough i remember in the trial when he came on the field and they put him on the wing i was like there is no way that he's a winger like mm. why is he on the wing and then obviously they moved mm. into fullback yeah so if you're if you're a young woman or a young uh, man like and people have been telling you how your life you're too small utter nonsense utter nonsense um, still, still time <laughs> still time <laughs> <laughs> thanks mate uh Okay, uh, in regards to other, Isaiah Guitar, look, we speak about Isaiah Guitar every week, so it's kind of, Tavita Pengai Jr. You know, like, we know he has this in him, and yes, let's get all the disclaimers out of the way. He needs to back it up, disclaimer out of the way. So let's just focus in on the performance. That's exactly what they need. Like, what, a mongrel performance. You could see he nearly got caught up in the bullshit, and then he pulled himself back. <laughs> and if he could just stay on that, that line between crazy and not crazy and silly and, and smart, if he can just stay more towards the smart side, he could be exactly what they need, at, at the very least, to keep them in contest with the top eight, especially with a guy like Flegler out for the season, Gilbert out for the season. Uh, he's exactly what they need. I feel pretty confident that Wayne's going to get good stuff out of him for a 10-week period. Mm. After that, I, I've got no idea what's going to happen with TPJ, but I, I, I think that he's going to be fantastic for them at the back end mm. of this season. Jeez, <laughs> just like... You're, sometimes you wonder why like bigger players like like big athletic front rowers like him you know get extra lifelines or an extra year here or these big contracts but when you see them work the way they're intended to work as players you go oh okay well it makes sense why clubs are so willing to take punts on guys like that because they can dictate we, we focus on halves and granted yes halves dictate games 
But front row is almost just important mm. because there's not many halves without a good front row that do really well. It's, it's a reason why at the Storm, I think Bromwich was their highest paid player before he left. Your front row is, it's not as important as, your, in, as, important as your half, but it's, it's nearly on par with your fullback. And in some cases, you could argue it's as important as your fullback. And the reality is you very rarely see halves be able to overcome not having a good front row pairing. Whereas a front row can kill it Without a good half yep. pairing. Like, look at Payne Haas in the the years where we didn't have a half. He was still killing it. And, a, yeah, a good front rower can turn a good half back into a great half back too. Mm. He's just like this, the prototype for the modern day. Perfect front rower, isn't he? Mm. Like mobile, powerful. He can get through big minutes. Just, yeah, everything else that goes on with TPJ. But footy, footy alone, far out, he, he's the kind of like that can propel him towards that top eight spot for the rest of the season. Do you reckon he follows Wayne down to... South Sydney or? Oh, at this stage, no. But if in the next eight weeks he kills every single game, mm. maybe. You get him on cheap. Because that's the other thing as well. Like you've obviously got um, the Tongan coach taking over there mm. with the Dolphins next year. So there's a connection there as well. This, uh, his performance, I thought, was on a bit of a knife edge early. He was, he was definitely heft up and, and full of beams. Mm. Uh, there was a... He took that quick tap after taking the catch in the in goal and he shoved off Cody Walker and then he went to take it really quickly and he, he actually dropped the ball. And I thought that's just a loose carry. Like that they yeah. might give it like but he got a bit lucky, I thought. They said, No, 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 Cody Walker was in the road. <laughs> Penalty. I wonder whether the, the whole night might have oh, stopped yeah. a little bit. <laughs> Mate, yeah, it's it's a fair point. It's a fair point. Yeah. If that goes the other way, does his head just fall off? Yeah, that was early. Um Yeah, the refing on the weekend. That was, that was crazy, that one. Ouch. Ouch! There was a few. There was a few crazy ones. We'll get to the Tigers game, though. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so yeah, great win for the Dolphins. Uh, onto the Rabbitohs. Um, look, like at least they look a million times better than at the start of the year. Like I think at the moment the Rabbitohs were in such a bad position ten weeks ago that, in my opinion, I'll take losses like this because at least mm. they're fighting. At least they're putting points on the board. I thought it was really, you know, as a fan, watching Jai Arrow blow up every time they scored. Like, that's going to make you feel happy as a fan, going, fucking oath, at least he cares, at oh, least he's that passionate. Absolutely, absolutely. I absolutely love seeing that. He, I also loved after the game where he got interviewed and he was like, oh, well, my season's over now. But you could see how angry he was about that decision. He's like, it was taken out of my hands. I wanted, I want to keep playing, but it is what it is. Like, what? I, just, he, I love seeing that. Well, he probably was supposed to get surgery weeks and weeks and weeks ago, but he kept. he probably came to a compromise with the club where he's like, no, nah. and they were like, "Listen, if you can, we'll we'll compromise with you. We'll meet you halfway, get to this round, and then go and do it, so that you're ready for the preseason." He probably said, oh, "All right, I'll do it that that way." Um, so yeah, I thought Jaira was really good. Um, Jackie White and great. Jacob Gagai on the edge there. I tell you what, Alex Johnson. I know he ended up uh, scoring a couple, but watching Gagai score three, he must have been going, "Jesus!" Oh, it's something. It's just remarkable how much the dynamic of the side has shifted with Cody Walker going to the right, like. You could used to just, uh, again, I know um, Johnson got a couple in this game, but he's been void of tries ever since Cody went to the left. You used to be able to absolutely bank on Alex Johnson to score a try every week in this side, and now it's banking on Jacob Gagai because everything goes down the right of Cody Walker. Mm. It's funny, as I said, I was at the Newmarket Hotel, the heart of South Sydney, watching this, and, mate, the place erupted when AJ scored because he doesn't score yeah. as many as he used to. Like, people just love him. Do you reckon they, they look to move him to the other side just to get him to help help him get that record? <laughs> yeah. The How season's far over. Is he? What is he like? Nineteen tries away or something? I think AJ. Uh, he's about does. about yeah, about nineteen. Yeah. It'll be interesting. Like if it stays the way it is for South Sydney at the moment, like I can't see him score more than three or four this season, mm -hmm. the back end. Um, some not so good news, and I don't know the I just have read the headline guy, so I'm not that clued up on it, but I do think Dodds, the guy that has been signed for three years, has just been dropped to reserve grade mm. over in Super League. And that's not... And apparently he's on a decent wicket. I, I just... That whole signing for me, I'm just... I don't understand what's going on there. I think South have found their halves, Baron. I think so too. I think he'd be crazy to bring... Unless... Look, unless he, in the preseason he kills it and the preseason tries to kills it, whatever. Obviously you leave room for, for change. But at the moment, the Cody and Whiten combination looks great. And, like, like, yes, it does leave the outside backs a little bit short, but next year when you've got Campbell Graham back, you've got Ty Munro. Is there anyone else to come back, Matty, into that back line? E even just with those two, though, it fills mm. out straight away. Yeah. I don't 
obviously watching after the Super League. I sort of follow bits and pieces, but I'm not watching week to week of it. So I, I don't know whether the fact that he's leaving has, has impacted the decision to drop yep. him from the top grade. Well, the Super, Super League, League fans, leave, let us know in the comments yeah. section. What's, what's the go with Dodds? Is, is it Lewis Dodds? Lewis Dodds. Lewis Dodds. What's the go there? Because, again, I think it's a three-year deal. and It's a, it's a three-year deal starting next year, yeah. And reportedly a, a big wicket. Like, the, it said 700 grand. I don't believe that. I, I just don't believe that you would sign a untested half straight into NRL on 700 grand a year. So I, maybe 500, but that's still a big wicket for a bloke that... Do we know anything about whether this was just like a Rabideau signing or if it's a Wayne signing? Well, I think Wayne said he had nothing to do with it, didn't he? Wayne did say that, but like you never know. You never know because it happened around the same time as JD getting punted and Wayne coming in. So you just we're, ne- we're, ne- we're never going to find out. Not before next year. If Wayne said he didn't, probably did. <laughs> yeah, I know, but it's it's one of those things where you, like if you stop believing what any like yeah. at face value, then you just can't talk about yeah, anything. Exactly, you're like, yeah. well. No one's telling the truth. He's like, had some crackers like that one. Oh, I know, I know. Well, the bunnies <laughs> got yeah, got Jamie Humphreys. Uh, it's not official. It's not official, but I mean, everyone says it's done. Yeah. And he's also was bloody good on the weekend. Awesome. So, look, very weird situation, but as just I said. On, just on Dodd, good news if you had uh, Jack Wellsby in your Super League super coach team. Came in and did quite well. <laughs> <laughs> bargain basement buy there. So. Uh, by the way, confirmed that Trey Fuller is currently a development player. Yeah, well. Wow, that's incredible. Uh, Keon, once again, kills it in the middle. Uh, whether he stays there or not, I'm, I'm unsure what happens there, but he was, again, phenomenal. 40 tackles, only one miss, uh, 21 runs, 185 metres, 56 post contact, three tackle breaks. Jeez, he gets through some work in the middle there. Reportedly fuming you missed team of the week. Be <laughs> <laughs> interesting to see back. how he bounces back from that this weekend. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Uh, so, yeah, all right. Onto, uh, onto, the, onto the Sharkies. But don't forget, KO's got you covered this footy season with every game of every round live and ad break free during play. From now until round 24, Broncos games are exclusive to Fox League, available on KO, so don't miss them this weekend when they take on the Knights. Some key games this week are Storm v Roosters, Panthers v Dolphins, exclusive Fox League and available on KO. Don't forget also, guys, Monday, 6 p.m., the green and gold drop, green and gold drop is happening. Got the hats, got the hoodies. These Once these hoodies are gone, guys, we are not doing another hoodie drop for a whole year. So be there Monday, 6 p.m. And we've got the bloke spray jackets and also green and gold bloke T-shirts. Um, all righty, the Sharkies defeat the Tigers 58 to 6. Uh, oh, man, did they need this victory, uh, the Sharkies? Now, granted, it was against the Tigers that, that weren't great, uh, but... For confidence and the fact that Hines is going to be out for quite a while, this is exactly what the Sharkies needed. Trindle had the game of his season, and I think it's just kind of confirmed. Well, hasn't fully confirmed, but for me personally, we were discussing last week of like, I just don't think Six sits well on his back. I just don't think he feels comfortable there. I think he wants to be a seven, and I think that's why when him and Nikos play together, they kind of step on each other's toes. He gets moved to seven. And I think that's where he wants to play, which is leaves the Sharkies in a bit of a, a pickle because, you know, Hines is going to be the seven going forward. But at the end of the day, Trindle's come out and absolutely ripped the Tigers. So when, when he does come back, let's say they keep going this run, the Sharkies, and they kill it. You know, it's going to be a tough ask to go, okay, Trindle, you go back to six when, you know, Hines does return if they keep doing this because that's how good he was on the weekend. I think it's going to be even tougher than that. I just, I, I don't think you're going to have them both in the side as halves. I, I just, I think it's so evident that they don't work together. They're both too dominant, and unfortunately for Trindle, like he, he could win five or six man of the matches here and on the trot and get dropped. I reckon. Could they? Could they go Hines? We want you to play six. <sighs> Maybe I guess I, I don't like it. I, mm. I, I, I kind of think you, you have to choose between them. Mm. It's always been my take. I, I'd have Atkinson as my 5'8", moving forward. Do we? I don't really know. Yeah. It's a tough one, isn't it? Mm. Like, I think the way Nico plays, with the amount of touches you get, he has to dominate and, and get the vast majority of the ball. That being said, like, and again, it's, it's one game. It's one game against it's the Tigers. Against the Tigers. Mm. It's a fun hypothetical, though, because if Trindle, we've seen... We've also seen this season, like, Trindle go down to Melbourne without Nico Hines 
and beat Melbourne. In no, the that game. was Atkinson yeah. by himself. Oh, yeah. Trinder didn't play that game. Didn't play that game. Was he played in the himself. halves with him. Um, um, Blake Braley played in the halves. Blake Braley, well, that's yeah, right. Yeah, McInnes was McInnes, named, yeah. and Blake Braley defended there at seven. Yeah, it. I don't want to get too excited about one game against the Tigers. Sorry, Hammy, but real litmus test. They're saying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like. If you were to come out and kill it for the rest of the season, did you could you toy with the idea of like Nico to fullback or something? I I don't know. Oh uh, yeah, the the, the Nico to fullback chat. I I think for this season is a bit over the top. If you want to do it for next season, have it from the start. Mm. I can hear it. Mm. I think doing it now is ridiculous, and I, I agree with you. Like playing. I'm sorry. I'm not. I'm, I'm not saying you want to do this, but playing Trindle at halfback off the back of that game against the Tigers. Like Nico's got you to what two top four finishes. Yeah, oh, yeah. Look, okay, I think the guy has to be Nico. Oh, this is, yeah, 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 I think yeah. we all believe the guy is Nico. It's more of a if he keeps playing, if he plays like this, the dis, the conversation. Put it this way, it's not about individual performances that's making uh, the discussion tough. It's about the fact that they just don't gel well together. Yeah, they work as a combo. Yeah, yeah. so so it's a very tough combo. Let's say, you know, when Hines was playing, they just lost like what was it? Four or five on the trot or something along mm. those lines. And then let's say Trindle kills it. It's a tough conversation to go to Trindle. Oh, you've just won four or five on the trot. See ya. Hines in, mm. Atkinson in. But then you go, well, Atkinson went down to bloody Melbourne and yeah. beat the Storm. Yeah. So it's not about individual performance because Hines is is the better rugby league player, I think, by quite a, quite a ways to Trindle. Now, granted, he's still young. And if he goes on to kill it, then fair enough. But it is a, like, it's a tough one because, okay, let's say Trindle kills it. I would, no matter what Trindle does in this next whatever months, Hines would still come in and beat yeah. my seven. Because five weeks isn't going to replace two years mm -hmm. of leading a team to the top four. But I also think that is unfair to Trindle when you're looking at form right now. And then you go, well, is that going to cause unrest with Trindle? Because I, can, I personally, when I watch Trindle and Hines play, it seems, when I watch Trindle play, it seems like he does not enjoy being six. And again, that, that might be me just projecting my own thoughts onto him by thinking that he's not a six, uh, but he looks way more comfortable in a seven jersey. And also, I actually think Atkinson is the best six. Well, Hines is the best six there, but Atkinson is probably the most likely to just, no matter what, you keep him at six. I don't think you can move Atkinson from six. I think the other thing with Trindle is, you know, it's uh, like, it's one thing not to be a 5'8", but then it's another thing not to be a 5'8 with Nico because he is so dominant. Like, you look at the way that Moylan had to play last year. Like, he would just – and it's crazy. Like, you're you're essentially saying to Trindle, mate, we can't put you in the team because you do too much. Mm. Like, yeah. it, it's bizarre. Yeah. But you look at the way that Moyes have played. He never, ever left that corridor. And for all of his downfalls, he brought the best out of Hines. Yeah. So we've only had a look at him trying to gel when it's been Hines at seven and Trindle at six. W would they – you pro would they give it a go just just to swap them and just Mine's, go right? A I think that's that's a more likely scenario because mm. Trindle's already been doing a lot of the kicking. Yeah, when Hines was back, and I I thought it was because Hines's calf is like a bit touch and go. Um, yeah, it's a weird position. Anyway, let's talk about like yeah. it's it's a positive as a club to a degree because you've got such strong players in key positions. I, I reckon Hines could would play some better footy when he yeah. didn't have to run the whole show. Yeah, you I think so. like he did at the storm. Great headaches to have for the club. Let's uh, we'll bring him back up if if Trindle can do it for another yeah, month. Yeah, well, let's let's wait a few weeks. But, <laughs> it, but again, when you have performances like this after the slump they just came yeah. on, these are the conversations that begin to be brought up. Um, but he's got to do it for you know. Let's see a month of rugby league first. Mm -hmm. Hines is literally, as you said, he's taking this side to the top four. You know, pretty much two years in a row. Um, yeah, I mean, like what were they six last year? But they've been hanging around the top four since he took over. Uh, so you know. That's much longer than four weeks. But Trindle just looks way more comfortable in the seven jersey. He was outstanding. He had a try. He had three try assists. Um, 116 run meters, two tackle breaks, a line break, two line break assists, 12 tackle, only three misses. Um, yeah, I thought he was outstanding. I really did. I thought that all the little things you see him trying to work when he's six, they just seem to suit the seven role much better. Uh, anything else on, on Trindle and his performance, how good he was? No, he was just top shot. I mean, like, at the end of the day, this game was against the West Tigers, who, you know, they, they really weren't in this contest, but Trindle can only play who's in front of him. We, we, we know that Trindle can play. We know he's a good footballer. We've all known this. The problem is, is they've come into this game with a massive form slump, and also, at full strength, they lost to the Tigers. 
So that, that's what it all all amounts mm. to. Like, oh shit, okay. But you know, got to see a month long footer. But he was outstanding. He was great. Atkinson was also really good. Um, we already spoken about Jesse Ramian, but he was phenomenal. Uh, but Britton Nikita, I thought he was, you know, went a bit quiet for a few weeks there. I think he's picked it back up. He had a try, had a try assist, 116 run metres, uh, three tackle breaks, a line break, a line break assist, 33 tackles, only two misses. Um, mate, he, he is just a pleasure to watch. And, and some of the shots that he pulled off as well, absolute bell ringers. I think Britton Nikita scores that try in any game from 1908 to now running that line. <laughs> you just can't defend it. It's tough. Like, you've, you've got to pre-read it, and you've got to try to shot him to stop him. And he's still probably going to bust Even you. if you do shot him, he's a big bit of gear. And going at that pace, it's <laughs> – he runs an incredible line. Mm. Best line around the comp, in my opinion. Yep. So, so good. Who stood out for you, Timmy? I mean, the Sharkies across the board. It's hard to knock any performances. Like, every single player on that team – had their moments. So I mentioned like the dynamic shift at the bunnies from the left edge to the right edge with Cody, but you see the dynamic shift from the right edge to the left when Nico Hines is out and Mully Taylor, who'd had a quiet probably four to five weeks, as had probably Kale Eero. You just see now Trindle stayed on the left, how much more dominant they became, and, and it just changed everything about this side. Yeah. Like it's, they're so balanced one to 17. Now we've seen them beat some good sides this year. All right, we know you've, there's a, a touch of the flat trap bullies about the Sharkies, but can they back it up against the better teams in the season? We've seen it already, but as you get towards the business end when it counts, we'll see. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see that this forward pack. Of I, I do think this forward pack, when it gets against the top tier forward mm. pack, just doesn't have that extra gear in them at this stage. Yeah, and that's probably. I think that's their biggest Achilles heel heading into the business end of the season is can this forward pack take the next step? Now, granted, I think by them recruiting Adam Fennell Blake already kind of suggests that they kind of see that is what they need. Um, I do think that they, you know, Dale Finucane's edge in the middle, you know, that toughness, that having been there, played big games is going to be tough to replace heading into the business end. But in saying that, like, they still beat the Tigers 58 to 6. You know, this is the same Tigers that, what did they score? Twenty points or twenty six points against the Melbourne Storm? Yeah, what was it last week. Twenty eight yep. points against the Melbourne Storm. So it's not, it's no cakewalk. So great, great performance. Um, Ido was great again. He had a try, a try assist, thirteen runs, hundred thirty. Nicker his ball over the top to Katoa. Oh, so you've, good. You've, you've basically got like a lethal centre playing in the back row for you that hits as hard as anyone in the comp and runs as I said probably the best line in the comp. That and then he had that car. pass. It's like, oh, oh, so good. He's so so good. Just an exciting edge back row to watch. And, and almost unique to a degree. Like, edge back rowers these days, they're fucking massive and got the footwork, the big fend, a lot of tackle breaks. Whereas, you know, Nikita is all about big shots in defence and great line running. I mean, mm. probably similar to more close to Liam Martin than mm. some of the other edge back rowers. Um, but, yeah, he's awesome to watch. Uh, Katoa, he, he had two tries. Good to see him back on the wing there. Um Anyone else stand a few boys? Lutalo, 200 metres and a, and a hat-trick as well. Um, he'd have to be in the – he'd probably be in the, probably the top three wingers of the of the comp. Him, To'o and probably Lomax this year, the ones that we, we speak about yeah, the most. Yeah, Bourne Weiss, I'd yeah, say. Yeah, he's had a great year and, yeah. uh, and and put it on again on Friday. You mentioned there, obviously, like how they're going to go against those top teams and those top forward packs. Like, I got the bye this week. I, I do feel a little bit sorry for them that in the next six or seven weeks, I, they don't play any of the top four sides. Yeah, it's good and it's bad because it's good and it's bad, but like you just know, no matter what they do for the next six weeks, the chat will be come week yeah. one yep. as well. They haven't beaten one yeah. of these teams in but, so long. Blah the, blah blah. The positive is though for them is they might land. I mean, it doesn't matter where you land in top four, but like the the run they have home, they probably could end up finishing second, uh, second or third. Well, they at the moment they're they're in fourth and the. The Storm and the Panthers 1 and 2 have already had their buy. So they've got one game up their sleeve there. So it's pretty much even Steven now. They can win those games. Which, like, they're pretty much locked into the top four if they just keep playing solidly. <laughs> and I guess that's the other beauty of it. They don't play either, either of those two no. games. So they're, they're not giving away points to them no. either. It, that chat's interesting now because they have beaten – they beat Melbourne. They beat the Roosters. They beat Warriors over there in round one when they weren't favourites. They beat Broncos a few weeks ago when Broncos were heavy mm. favourites. So – they're not flat track, track bullies anymore, but people do still well, do say I, that. I look at the Sharks, and I've always been – I just think people are too critical of the Sharks. I feel like when Fitzgibbon arrived, 
he, there's a cycle, and, and squad cycles are usually like three to four years. They're in their third year, and they're, they're playing like they're in their third year of the cycle. They're just each year progressively getting a little bit better, a little bit better. And right now, granted, there's still quite a ways to go, but they're sitting in the top four, and they probably will lock themselves into another top four finish. So since Fitzgibbon has taken over and Hines has taken over as half as well, They've had two top four, if, if this goes on, we're speaking fucking, but let's just assume they do finish in the top four. Um, that's two top fours in the first, two out of three. Yeah. It's friggin' pretty good. And I granted, I know you're not there just to make up numbers, but if they go top four and then go a game deeper uh, this year, like in the, in the cycle of a squad that is getting Adam from Noor Blake next year, that's pretty good for me. That's, I, I think that that's a good development, step by step, brick by brick. You know, look at some of these other clubs. Look at the Broncos and look at the Warriors right now. They've gone from the, the tippity top to now the bottom. Mm. And everyone rants and raves about how great they were last year. But, I mean, in reality, you know, yes, they got to a grand final. But who's got a more of a solid foundation right now? It's the Sharkies over the last three years. So, yeah, I, I, I always think the, I've always thought the Sharkies were unfairly criticised because they get to the – they lost – when they get to the big games, they lose them. But, I mean – as I said, when they took over, he, they were finishing 10th. Yeah, and the, the other thing that is going to be tough this year, which unfortunately is just the reality of it, is that, you know, no matter what they do in the next six or seven weeks, which I think they'll win the majority of those games, Nico's going to literally be available as soon as we get to finals. Mm. And the 10-minute conversation we just had, we're still not going to have answers to that. Yeah. And they're going to have to sort of work it out on the fly, playing these top sides all of a sudden. And also, if they go on and lose in the finals, it'll be immediately playing on Hines. You should have, you should have kept Trindle at seven. Yeah, exactly right. They're not going to be able to win regardless. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and yeah. so the only way he doesn't get shit put on him is if he goes a bit deeper in the finals. Mm. Uh, so it's, it, you know, it's a tough position to be in. But the good thing is they're in the top four. You know, bloody good stuff from uh, Craig Fitzgibbon. I think, it's, I think what the Sharks have done in the last few years has been great. I've been a big fan of it. Um, okay, on to the Tigers. Um... Man, just unfortunately, um, this a lot of this roster at this stage in their careers is not NRL standard. Yes, the sin bin was outrageous. Like, I cannot believe, even if he wasn't square, 10 in the bin for that? Like, it, it, like for example, the Katoni Staggs one, yes, that's 10 in the bin because it was so outrageous. Like, it was so, like, bro, they're nearly about to score and also... You're so not square and you know it. Whereas like the, the Coruscant one, even if he thought he wasn't square, he, surely he didn't think he was not square by that much. It would only be like a little bit, you know, so it could be like, well, that could naturally happen in any tackle. Why? This is silly. Why can we not challenge that as well? I thought the same. I, I was confused why, with that too. Why not? I, think, I thought you could challenge, but what someone said, because it's subjective. But then I, I was like, I feel like that's been challenged before. Mm. But it's a, like... Because it's a subjective, like some refs will allow you to be a little bit off centre. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like what is actual pure centre? I, I kind of feel like though, if it was just a penalty and they were taking a penalty shot, I think, I reckon you'd be able to challenge it then. Weird, I, I, I think yeah, when it's a sim the bin, they don't mm. let you, I think it's because the refs made the call, it is what it is. Mm. Yeah. I, I don't reckon, I reckon if it was a sim bin, they would have been allowed just to challenge it. Just not saying about actual incident losses a game, but we all we heard the stats last week about, you know, we, we had more sim bins than anyone. Yeah. We were like 64 nil down in, you know, across sin bin periods over the last three or four games. Just from that moment on, that was, that was it. Like, that was really suck the, mm. the life. The, the other question, and I'm with you, boys, I think that, I think he got square and I don't think it should have been sin bin. Let's say he was a fraction out and it was yeah. deemed that he was not square. If he wants to blow the penalty because of the circumstance of like being a line break and a fast play, all that, does it then have to be deemed a professional foul or can it just be, could it have just been a penalty or the second that he ruled it as a penalty, did it have to become a professional foul? No, I don't foul? think so. I think a professional foul by nature mm. is an intent. Yeah. Mm. There's an intent behind it of like, you have done that in a professional manner to dissuade, like so to stop them. So why not just penalise him? That's, that's what I mean. Like, yeah. even if, so if he wasn't square, it was only by a small margin because he was like- Such a small margin. Very, very bizarre. I think he just got a rush of blood, yeah. to be honest, as a ref. I think he got a rush of blood. He saw it. it. They may have scored the next run, maybe not. And he's just immediately, and then I think as soon as he saw Appy, like confront him about it and be like, I think you could see on his face going, oh shit, I might've screwed that up. Yeah, which, Appy if it is a rush of blood, <laughs> so be it, but you should be able to challenge that. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah, mate, yeah. so I don't know why you can't challenge it, but it says decisions that can't be challenged include forward passes, roll balls, and discretionary penalties, including 10-meter offsides, ruck infringement, relating to playable speed. 
Tackled into touch after held call and descent. So that's a ruck indiscretion. Wouldn't it be? A, like markers would be it's a ruck. It's either ruck indiscretion or off, like offside. But yeah, probably ruck indiscretion. And so like, but, which both know, can't unless be you get a ruler out, you know, what is square? Every, every um, ref's interpretation be would be slightly different. Offside if you're not square. So yeah. either way, you can't challenge either of them. Yeah. Anyway, um, in regards to the team, look, I just unfortunately right now, whether it's because they're developing into it or because they're just not up to it, but I just think as a squad, they, there's a few players here that just um, aren't up to NRL standard. Maybe they're building into the future and maybe it's because of their age. But I, I just think there's, there's too many times where – there's some players that are just okay with making the error or okay with, you know, not tying in in defence or it, I don't know. And, I, and Benji Marshall gets in every press conference and says, you know, all week we have hammered home not to do this, not to do that. But it just doesn't seem to be getting through to the players. And I don't know whether that is that a reflection on Benji's deliver, like the way he's delivering the message or is it a roster that is just not reacting to the message and therefore changes need to be made? Mm. I'm not sure. Hammy, what do you reckon? Yeah, I don't know. It was just, it was a tough one and a couple of the, you know, the players you'd hope maybe might, you know, stand up and have been pretty good in the, in the last couple of weeks, um, you know, probably didn't have their best games. I think the first try that happened, um, I think poor old Stefano got stepped in the, in the middle. That kind of led to that. Right in between Clemmer and Stefano. Yeah. I don't know why Benji starts. Both those boys. I just, I don't get, I don't get then, it. Then, not long after that try, we actually got up the other end and we got a scrum 10 metres out. And off the scrum, all got turned back in under for Stefano. Straight off the scrum, he, he dropped it straight away to mm. follow up that, that previous one. And we probably just needed like a little bit more, I don't know, those little little moments there um, where you just need a little bit more consistency or someone like Stefano, who is a leader in this team, to kind of really, really um, set the tone. Little things like that kind of, you know, um, I guess they got a little bit uh, kind of contagious on the night. We were pretty good for a while there. Stayed down their end. There was probably, I think we had four or five sets on their line. And credit to Cronulla, they defended really well. We just couldn't get get over the line. And then there was a, an intercept pass, I think maybe Caesar might have thrown it. Mm. And then uh, from that moment on, the, basically the floodgates opened and the Sharks were away for the rest of the game. But um, again, we had a pretty decent first 20 minutes with a couple of little areas in there. But as soon as things didn't go our way, it just, um, we just got towed up. I've got to say... In the playing, this playing squad's defence, it coming out in the media so openly and honestly that a bunch of players are getting shot to the Super League and that they're looking for players, like, that's not helping your cause. No. Like, as a player, are you really going to rip and tear when you, they're openly, and granted, every club this is happening, but it's, it's, it's done delicately. Like, it's done behind closed doors, whereas, like, it was so public that they were over shopping players to the Super League. Like, how's that good for team morale? Yeah. Like, well, that's... Clearly it's not. We only had one player run for more than 100 <coughs> metres on Friday night. That was Adam Dewey. So That's crazy. Yeah, not a lot of ripping. Silver lining, he's looking decent. Mm. He looks like he's he, he's made a good return. I mean, there was parts of this season where it sounded like he wasn't going to be back this year at all for him to be back with 10 weeks to go and actually looking pretty good. That's a positive to take away. What do you reckon, Timmy? <clears throat> yeah. If I was the Tigers, every time I watch him – this game was almost a bit of an exception because they were just like so badly belted off the park, but it's just their edge defence for me. And it has been for years that it's just so brittle mm. and gets run through. Teams score so easily against their edges. And there are a lot of games, even when they get done relatively easily, I feel like their middles hold up half all right. Like they've got on paper good names in their pack. I'd just be going out there trying to sign one or two centres who won't break the bank, who are just very solid defence, defensive-minded centres, especially with like someone like Luai coming along, Dream Bull's got a lot of attack in him, Appy Corris around the ruck, a ton of attack in him, Lockie Galvin, I think he's just an absolute future star. They're going to have points in them. They just need to fix their edge defence, and you know whether that's someone like a, a Remus Smith or a Rocco Berry, like, Blokes that aren't going to break the bank, mm. but can just shore up their edge defences. Jerome Luai will be terrific for it next year uh, in the halves, but Lockie Galvin, great defender. The centres. Mm. They need bodies there that can do a job because they chop and change combinations all the time. And look, maybe Adam Dewey's one for that with a few more games under his belt. Uh, notably, a, a pretty good defender. And that, uh, it was a right, was it the right side? Was, was, Lob was on the mm. right right side. And he was with a, another rookie too, wasn't he? Far Tape. Yeah. Jeez, like, 
putting those two rookies together, mm. that's, oh. that's recipe for disaster. Yeah. yeah. But then, like, who else is he? Has? He's got a young fella, but he's also a rookie as well, uh, coming through. Uh, uh, Lua Lee. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's, um, he's only a young fella as well, but he's got a lot of upside. I'm, I'm not sure if he might be under a bit of an injury cloud or something at the moment, but he was great a few weeks ago at Campbelltown and – He's someone I'd be looking to get if he's fit and healthy a lot more games into this season. Yeah, Josh Felody is right head man who, once again, he's only played two or three games. A lot of young guys. I, I, I don't mind Tim's idea going and signing, you know, maybe like a Tom Opicic of the world or someone like that. Just someone that would just come in and do a job. So, yeah, Tom Opicic. I mean, granted, this bloke's probably worth a bit more money than that, and we're going to get to him shortly, but Moses Sully, a defensive powerhouse this season. We'll get to him later, but someone like Sully and give him a little bit more. And I know it's easier said than done finding this defensive-minded centre, but... They're out there, and I think they probably got overlooked because they don't have the attacking upside. Mm. And I said, Remus Smith is probably a relatively decent example of that. Um, Do you think Olam was their hope to be that guy? Oh, was he injured? I don't, yeah, maybe. Olam's always been an okay defender, but he's mm. never been like... you've never Noted like, defender. No, like he can shot, but his even, reads have never been... Even good. if you were to find a guy like you mentioned him before, um, Bo Fermore, play him out Some there. Bo Fermore, yeah. Just, it's just one of those clubs like recruitment for them, it's tough. Yeah, like, it, it, they got Taruva coming, yeah, but to sign someone like that, it won't be. Taruva might Taruva be. Taruva might help. Yeah, but center, he could be. Yep, they'll probably put Taruva at center. Yeah, Taruva so, and Dewey in the centers. Yeah. Oh, but then all of them. I just out. every time I watch the Tigers, and whenever it goes bad, it's just the edge defense. Mm. Oh, this is, yeah, fuck, it's tough. It is really tough. Um, maybe it's a matter of as well they're, they're blooding so many young players. I'd love to see how much mm. they're. How many teenagers they've debuted compared to other clubs this year? Mm -hmm. Whether that's a high amount, um, but really, really tough loss for the Tigers, and unfortunately, it's looking like potentially another spoon this year, which is, geez, tough run, very, very tough run between them and the Eels. I tell you what, when you look at this Tiger side and then you look at this Eel side, the fact that their Eels are even close to Tiger side is outrageous. Ridiculous. Actually, outrageous. Yeah. Um, Dollar forty-five for a three-peat on the spoon. Unfortunately, ooh, the ouch, ouch. Uh, that feels overs. <laughs> 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 um, alrighty, <clears throat> next game. Don't forget, guys, giving away a thousand dollars in cash prizes, two five hundred dollars cash prizes. All you gotta do is fill out the survey. It's in the show notes. Take you two seconds, and it really helps the shows. And you get a chance to win five hundred. dollars Alrighty, now it's time to chat to Dwayne Bennett, mate. Big win against South. Mate, it was electric. I was right there in the stands, uh, revving up the crowd and soaking in every moment. The fans were amazing and their energy really lifted the boys on the field to just grab that W. It was so good. Oh, what a win. Now, what's the question from the community this week, mate? Mate, uh, it's from a, a, a man named Andrew. Uh and he's a dragon supporter, and he's asking who will be the kangaroos' foot fullback at the end of the year. Ooh, who will be the kangaroos' fullback at the end of the year? That is actually a great question. I think that heading into this year, you probably had a couple of blokes locked in, but I do think. Look, I'm going to talk about it if it got selected right now with all the information that we have right now, not from how we think they're going to go towards the end of the year, with how they've played so far this season. Hurts me wee little heart to say being a huge Reese Walsh fan but uh, or and Ponga fan, but I'd have to say Dylan Edwards. I think that he's absolutely been the best fullback this year. He's been the most consistent. Uh, and I think that, you know, he's already played for Australia, so he's got that out of the way. You know, it's hard to go past a guy like Edwards, especially considering he's pipped Tedesco for the Blues jersey and also Walsh has been out, Ponga has been out injured. <clears throat> Dylan Edwards gets selected in my Australian side if it was selected today. I think if the New South Wales Blues win game three, I think it's Edwards. If they lose, I reckon you're going to get a uh, maybe a fullback kangaroos jersey thrown in the middle of Edwards and Tedesco on grand final day. Winner takes all. Really? So no, no Ponga, no, KP, uh, well, no Ponga, no Walsh? I reckon there's every chance neither of them are playing finals. Mm. So, yeah, I reckon there's every chance that Teddy could find his way back in there. Wow, okay. Yeah, I do think... This will change complete, could change completely in the space of two, three days once Origin 3 is played out. But I'd actually probably lean just towards Caelan Ponga, picking him right now. Mm. And I think that battle for me is between Ponga, Walsh, Edwards, and it is extremely tight. I just think the attacking upside of Caelan Ponga, I think defensively he's a little bit more sound than Reese Walsh. 
I think he's has just has less errors in his game than Reese Walsh and Look, if the Blues come out and win and Dylan Edwards kills it, that changes everything. Mm. I, I can, I, at the moment, if I had to, like, I know we said select it right now, but I probably predict KP going on and playing well enough to get selected by the end of the season. Mm. Dwayne, uh, what's the weekly update on the Finlanders, mate? Mate, the Dolphins continue to fight to stay in the top eight, of, of course. Good win, obviously, on the weekend. Needs to be consistent. We need more wins. Um, but what's even more amazing is support from our Finlanders, you know, and NRL fans from all clubs have come together to support the Dolphins, uh, creating in, an incredible unified atmosphere every single game. It's that collective energy from Finlanders that fuels the team, and we thank we can't thank them enough. Uh, keep showing up and cheering us on. Together, we're unstoppable. And, you know, like all you have to do to become a Finlander is just sign up to finland.com Download your di- digital passport on your smartphone. Don't forget new Finlanders out there. Get that iconic, the magnificent budget direct fin sent to your home address. Thanks for joining us, brother. All righty, Titans defeat the Eels. Let's get straight into it, shall we? Uh, look, <laughs> the Titans are just, they're weird because you watch them play for the last few weeks especially and you go, oh, mate, this Desi has a Titans. They've turned around. There's Desi Hazlitt DNA. It's looking good. Unfortunately, we have seen this from the Titans before. And then you go and look where they're 14th on the ladder. And so you go, shit, am I getting bamboozled by the Desi Hazlitt magic? Or are we really watching a side be turned into a Desi Hazlitt side? I don't know which one's true. Like, I don't know. It, it could be that we are witnessing a side turn into a Desi Hazler side and next year they're going to come out of the blocks and be exactly who we thought they were going to be this year. But then you, then the, the numbers don't lie. They're sitting 14th. So I just don't know where to land with them. But from this specific performance, though, outstanding performance. And Campbell at six is getting more and more like, okay, it's not a question of, like, whether he should be one, six, whatever. More and more of, like, you might have to build your side around this guy. That's how good he's been. Um, granted, yeah, he still had his missed tackles or whatever, but look, there's plenty of sixes and sevens in the competition that miss tackles. He is absolutely electric with the ball. Um, and as I said, it's getting to the point where you, you might have to consider, mate, you need to build a side around this block. That's how good he is at six. I'm leaning towards that. Mm. And you know what? If he's going to play 5-8 and defensively there might be issues, but if he's playing the footy is now in attack and it's lights out stuff, fuck, at least it solves one problem at fullback. Mm. It's one less guy you have to worry about. Yep. I, you know, obviously Foles re-signed the other day, which is a great re-signing for another year. I, they'd be my half pairing for next year. And and it's a, I tell you what, if you're a team going up against the Titans, and you look up and you've got Campbell across, like it's a scary prospect for any team defending a guy like Campbell. Like <laughs> it's he's not just good for a team that's running 14th. His skill level and ability to attack and create points is as good as any player. Like. Put it this way, there is a world where if you put Walsh and Campbell both at six, Campbell could come up with just as many points as Walsh. Now, I think Walsh at fullback is different because of that speed and that pace, but that's how creative he is with the ball. He's a, he's a, even though they're actually smaller players, he's actually quite a different player to Walsh, but like that's how high quality his attack is. Like That's the tier it can be on when he's at his best. Yeah, I mean, just on the Titans in general, as you say, Kempi, like I, I would have zero confidence they can come out and win any of their next three games because they're so up and down this season. As you said, they're 14th on the ladder for a reason. But if nothing else, there's some really good building blocks for next season. Mm. Um, and there is a bit of how Desi has the DNA to this side. I like what I'm seeing. They've got so many options. They've got depth in key positions, as we keep talking about. And yeah, as I said, around Jaden Campbell, he's defensively, there's going to be issues in there as well, but mm. he's been solid. He doesn't mean too mm. bad defensively. There's a miss here and there's a miss there, but he's held up a lot better in the front line than I anticipated he would have with, with his size. Mm. Mate, he's, and also that hit that he put on the other rookie. Mm. Like, yeah. the, what I loved about that, it's not, necess- not necessarily that he caught force an error. It's the want to get in the contact. And that's half the battle in defence, and, and is the toughness. Other, and the other thing is, mate, look, talk about the Titans as a whole and how they're building for the future. 
What do we say about Cameron Trialdo this time last week about how year one at the Doggies, it takes time to build. You're not going to, like, you inherited a new squad. You're not going to get what you want. Things aren't going to happen overnight. Mm. It takes time. Desi's got this squad this year, and we've seen some growth in them despite ladder position, despite losses, all that. They're looking okay at different stages, so there's no reason why by next year they can't be pushing for a top eight spot. Yeah. It's, um, I, I, I'm leaning towards we are seeing mm. Desi Hasler. But I'm just so hesitant because we have to remember how up and down, even in this season they've been. Um, and, and the positive, one of the positives anyway, is the fact that we're looking at a team that may have sorted out its halves situation, at least for the next 12 months. Like you've got a locked in, sorted, Kier, Kieran Foran is a seven, Campbell is a six. Because K- Campbell probably, I'd assume he's only gonna get better at six. Is it, could he make the switch eventually to seven? Because I still, you kind of mentioned there that you've sort of locked in your halves for a little while and, and, you know, the fullback thing seems to be taking care of itself at the minute. But still get a bit worried about AJ Brimson and, like, kind of where he sort of fits in. Um, you know, Campbell, looked, he looked great the other day. I just wonder whether, you know, um, has he got the skills to make it to seven and then you could have Brimson at six alongside him as well. That's, that feels to me like... <laughs> I'd love to see it. I'd love to see what Saturday happens. Saturday 3pm would be unreal every I'll tell you week. what, Hugh, Hughes has changed the game for me. Because if Hughes can go from the player he was to a seven, mm. then, like, I'm like, well, fuck, you know, maybe, maybe. Mm. Um, but, like, this is Campbell's last two games. He's got six tries, this and a try in his last two games. That's how good he's been. Um, so, yeah, he's been phenomenal. Uh, some other players. I want to give a shout-out to Mub. Just a absolute pleasure to watch every single week. And every time he plays, it's Philip Sammy. Yeah. Like, he... When we had some uh, wingers going down and Selwyn wasn't available and all that kind of stuff, he was a guy that I was like, I wouldn't mind throwing him a jersey on the wing. Like, that's when, uh, with a few injuries of Queensland. Because there's never a game, he's a bit like Rapana, where he just fights in every tackle. It's messy, it's all over the shop. He gets a bit lippy here and there. You're obviously giving it to Gutho with the Gutharina. <laughs> Gutharina, like, all that stuff. But for charity. It's obviously, obviously for charity. Um, but that's what you want on your side. A guy that's going to rip and tear, get, get into the dirty stuff. Not, I don't mean dirty as in like play dirty, but I just mean get into the real friction of competition. And he's always at the forefront. He had 247 metres. Um, sorry. Just bring this up. Oh, she looking for that. I love that Phil Sami just holds on to this Gutharino thing <laughs> and just goes <laughs> Can't after let it. Go. I think it's great. Um, so, yeah, he, he had uh, a try. He had 21 runs, 247 metres, 90 post contact. <laughs> Five tackle breaks, a line break, a line break assist, 12 tackles, only one miss. Um, yeah, I love him, man. I think he just rips and tears every time he plays. The longer he's on the field, the better for the Titans, the less he's injured because he's just such an important part of the modern game of rugby league, and that's outside backs making a bunch of metres and being hard to tackle. Um, so, yeah, he was outstanding. Uh, Cam Pereira, just a try scoring. Like What I like about Cam Pereira is like when you see the ball going to him, and you're forgetting that Calm Pereira, Pereira is about to get the ball. You're like, oh, there's not a, they're not enough space. They're going to get run out. Like they've give you, they haven't given enough space to mm. score. And then you realise it's Calm Pereira. And that first ten metres when he hits it, it's like the defence is in slow mo. Here's one, mate. Like I've been thinking it all season, and it, it comes to mind. Honestly, every week, Tim, there are such highs and there are such lows. Like. Calm Pereira's bad games and defensive issues, whether it's like in contact or reads, they're very poor. But the upside in what Calm Pereira could be, like it's very Fox areas, mm. but I would argue almost quicker. You give him an inch and he's away and gone and he just creates, creates, yep. creates. The Titans, for all their defensive issues in recent years and trying to build for the future, you just have to stick with him. Like he's got 36 tries in 36 career games at the moment. He's lethal. Yeah. Just noticed too. I, you know, people were calling him for Queensland. Born in Lismore. Yeah. Get him in there. Another one, yep. eh? Lock him in, Queenslander. In. But yeah, when you consider, as Timmy said, 36 tries in 36 games, and he hasn't played in the top 12 team mm. yet. Well, I mean, they were, they were ninth when <laughs> their last coach got sacked. <laughs> oh shit. Um, and. <laughs> But you sit there and and if you do position them, you go, nah, here's our guy. There are so many points in him. There'll be defensive issues. There'll be games where you go, why are we persisting yeah, with yeah. him? But 
gee, I think it's it's worth doing. I think Desi Hazel is the perfect coach for him <coughs> because he's had such experience dealing with these elite athletes mm. and knowing how to round out their game. Like, if Fox stays at the West Tigers, no offence, he doesn't become the Fox. Well, if everyone else stayed, he would have. <laughs> 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 Am I wrong? <laughs> well, I don't think you had the coaching for him. I don't think he... And so my point was going to be... You don't even need a coach if they all stay there. <laughs> my point was going to be Fox going down to Storm and being coached by Bellamy is what rounded him out to be one of the best wingers of his generation. Um, and I think that if, if Cam Pereira stays at the Titans and he's coached by, you know, lower tier coaches or coaches that aren't premiership winning coaches like Desi Hasler... He probably could go down the route of unfulfilled potential, but Desi has like, he knows how to get the best out of um, guys like Cam Pereira. He knows how to do, like look at look at what he did with Tommy Turbo, like look at the season Tommy Turbo had. That wasn't the funny guy. There was uh, there was venom in that. Yeah, upset, hurting. Yeah, sorry, bro. Yeah, okay. I'm a bit emotional to be honest. Okay, <laughs> but, um, tough week. Yeah, it's been, yeah, it's been actually. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, Cam Pereira I think under Desi Hasler he will flourish And I agree with you, Timmy is like He's worth sticking with, he scores that many points If his defence can be a bit Touch and go here or there You can round that out Again, find a really good defensive centre To pair with him yep. And just make it work And just, make, find a way to make, and it just work. make his defensive system on his edge Simple, Yeah, really really simple He knows his job, he knows what to do um, two two tries this close to a hat trick as well. Shout out to Dill mm. Dill Brown, I think, with the little as he was putting it down. Yeah, yeah. saved it, clutch by him. But uh, very exciting, Campera. Yeah, he got a feature in team of the week, obviously. But Chris Randall again, boys. Gosh, he's been a good signing. Fifty tackles, zero misses. He, to fix it. So he gets signed from Knights as a n- number nine, and then they have basically they're flush with number nines, and gets turned into almost like a bit of a curtain man at the Bulldogs where he suits 13 in the modern era perfectly. Mm. But he's also just had a few knocks where he's just played in the front row. Mm. Just plays undersized and, and, and just goes at him. Halves, he, everywhere. Yeah, everywhere. Uh, yeah, there was one, he was named at number six or something at one stage this year. So Randall almost missed a fix it. And he's the kind of guy that, at a you know, maybe the Knights, he kind of out of sight, out of mind, gets put in reserve grade. And you just never know that. He could sit in reserve grade for a long period mm. of time and then that's it. Goes to the Titans and, you know, he's becoming a vital, vital part of this side that whenever they need someone to, to, to do all the clean-up work, all the tough stuff, like, he'll he'll take care of it. And before that, it was literally the hooker before him, Aaron Clark, who's now playing in the front row week to week. I just can't believe how much the game's changed in such a short period of time. If you had to set a front row is going to be Aaron with have Aaron Clark and Chris Randall in it, or said, mate, <laughs> they're going to get absolutely fucking steamrolled. Yeah. But the modern game... You can be smaller and more mobile. That's what like, I, I, I we'll, we'll get to it soon with the Broncos, but I, I had a few people message me on the weekend saying, Fuck, that's what the Broncos get for picking three hookers. I'm like, the Titans do it every week. <laughs> <laughs> do it every week for six months. Yeah. Um, so, look, really, really good win. Both from her getting through a bunch of work. Again, 14 runs, 126 metres, 49 post contact, five tackle breaks, 43 tackles. Um, geez, he, he must have a motor on him. I'd love to know how he goes in fitness because he fucking rips out the numbers Fly. every week. Every single week. Anyone else stand out for you guys in the, the Titans? Oh, all good, mate. All good. Uh, but, yeah, look, I think if you look to what happened at the Bulldogs last year where he had to rip everything out to start anew. Now, Desi has a, has a, Hasler hasn't necessarily gone out and got a whole new roster, but it does kind of look like they've got a bunch of new systems and that's why it was, took them so long to finally kind of click into mm. gear. Oh, the, could, one, the one other... Holy moly, Jaden Campbell can goal kick. Oh, yeah. He strikes them so, so sweet. Well. He's, he's such a good player, man. He's such a good player. Um, so similar in many ways to his old man. Yeah. Mm. Fullback, halves, whatever. Goal kicker. Have the, uh, have the Titans signed anyone for next year as it stands? They, uh, is, uh, I don't, other than the uh, rugby union fella. Uh, Carter, yeah. Um, but, yeah, so, look, hopefully they can. I'll probably be eating my words in four weeks' time, but I do think that we might be seeing a bit of a, a turning of the corner. Uh, for the Titans. Onto the Eels. Um, yeah, look, I, I don't understand. Sanders, is he injured? I thought he did get named and then he... Played reserve grade. Played reserve game. grade, okay. Um, I guess. I, I, look, I, I understand that he's moving on from the club, but at the same time, I wouldn't be wanting, wanting to live, live, win the spoon. 
it's not like Dejan Arce is like going to be a long-term seven. So I'm, a, I'm not understanding that selection. Uh, look, we'll start with some positives. Regan Campbell-Gillard, he couldn't have done any more. Mm. He literally could not have tried any harder than he tried. It was one of his best games all year long. Um, and he, he, really, he really picked up the slack because you saw the effects of what they're like without Junior Paolo and RCG. Like, that's... It's... Like, genuinely, it's th when those two boys are on, they're at this standard, and then when they're not there, it's just, like, a totally different, like, levels and levels below that. It's literally, like, I, I know Moses wasn't there too, but when those two boys are on, like, this is a potentially top four side. When those two boys are on, but they just haven't been consistently on for the last few months, realistically. Well, see, I reckon, I reckon they've been going okay, not as good as they can go, but my point is, is that when they either get subbed off or one of them is injured... The, the 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 next guys up are like so far below them they just you don't see I just on the weekend they got dominated yeah it's so so frustrating for Parramatta fans because they're not they're not your normal you know team sitting last two in the competition the squad on paper as you said Rude they can be a certainly a top eight team they've got so much talent on there we've seen it obviously Mitchy Moses out in this game but. I think sort of going to what I think you're going on to say, Kim, just, they're just lacking depth. The depth is nowhere near. They lose near. one or two in the outside backs. They can't really cover it. They lose one or two in the forwards. I thought at the start of the year maybe their depth was all right, but, you know, Sean Lane's had a bit of a down year. Uh, Bryce Cartwright's a bit hit or miss. They're just not covering it really well if they if they are light on in the pack. And since Hopgood's been out as well, they're just – they don't have the depth. Jeez, haven't they missed him? And it's tough. They're in the bottom five of New South Wales Cup and Jersey flag too. Like that club is just in such a bad shape right now. It's it's almost it's so it's shocking because they they have such a big base that you would expect them after watching what Penrith have done mm -hmm. to lean into that and try and build systems. Like granted, I understand it takes time, but yeah, their depth is just nowhere to be seen. Like it is it is genuinely. Shocking that a team that would so would be so appealing to go to. You've got six, you've got seven, you've got one, all sorted. But, yeah, on the weekend, just just no good. 75% completion rate compared to 85, 86% from the uh, the Titans. Um, what do you reckon, Rue? It's a tough thing, isn't it, like Parramatta? You've you got all these teams in this competition that are struggling and missing so many things, and the vast majority of things that all these teams are missing, Parramatta have them in spades. Mm. The key positions, they just can't. Front row and halves. And I know Mitchell Moses has been out for quite a while, but yeah, jeez. Uh, got a 5'8", got a fullback. Like, the, the, the amount of talented back rowers that can't make this starting 13 week to week is just ridiculous. I, I, I don't, I'm not sure what you guys think, but geez, Bryce Carwright missing the starting side for Matt Dury, is, that's hit me for six. I can't work that one out. Uh, yeah, I found it really weird as well. I think Bryce has been really good the last few weeks. I think he's been great the last 18 months. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what's happening there because you look at them and you even look at their stats individually, like pretty good. It's just all the little tiny areas of the, like their trail, the all the one percenters we talk about it intangible all the time. Um, the biggest talking point though is, is Riles is reportedly asked or is going to be released from the Melbourne Storm. I tell you what, if you're Parrot Eels, that's what you want. You want him at that club, or if not at the club right now coaching, at least not coaching somewhere else so that he can be just putting everything in place to build towards next year. Yeah. Because and they're it, desperate for it. At worst, you want these players to have to come off the field and at least look at their future coach in the eye. Like, I don't, I don't know whether he'd come in and coach now, just because I don't think you'd want to tarnish. Mm. Mm. It's like, if he comes in and coach now and they're still going bad, the, like the fans will be like, oh, see, we're just this shit, blah, blah. <laughs> but at the very least, him being a, like, an overseer, an overseer, so that you're almost reporting to him to a degree, uh, because yeah, at the moment. I tell you what, like if the storm do release him, that's huge from them because Riles has been a part of the coaching staff and an integral part of it for a long time now. Like I always thought he was going to be well, he was, and then he went to Roosters, and then he yeah. went back to the storm. Yeah, I always thought he was sort of touted as the successor to Craig Bellamy, so I was surprised to see uh, him go and get you get Parramatta, but. He might be sitting there going, like, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to be a first-grade coach. I've done my time. For the Storm to say mid-season, you know, when they're in certainly a title window, that's big for them. Um, Clint Gutho, 26 runs, 265 metres, 70 post contact, four tackle breaks, a line break. I mean, does not stop trying. I, I've, I've heard this kind of growing, 
you know, question for Riles is like, does he keep Gutho? Does he not keep Gutho? I've got to say, and I know there's been pushes of like, we have to keep Blaise Slungy. And I do think that that is a, a priority. But look, be careful what you wish for in regards to moving on a guy like Gutho too soon, in my opinion. Like, <clears throat> you know, I, I, for, for the life of me, I just don't think Gutho is appreciated as much as he should be at that club. And if they move him too soon and they put, put Blaze in there too soon, it could be a disaster for everyone. The club, Blaze. I think there are plenty of clubs that would love to have a guy like Gutho at the club playing for them. Um, what do you reckon, boys? I love the idea of moving Blaze back there, to be honest with you, but I do agree with you, mate. Blaze, is, you are going to have to learn a lot of hard lessons for him until he's properly ready for it. And Gutho, like, I just no one puts in more effort week to week. Mate, he just ran for 265 metres. Yep. Like... Oh, I a do huge knock. Yeah, and I, it's hard to judge this team without Mitch Moses, but I did just think quite often throughout this game, whenever they did go out, out of the back to Gutho, there's just – they're just very flat, Parramatta. They're very pedestrian in everything they do at the moment. And I know that Mitch makes such a huge difference to that, but there, there are times where I sit there and I watch Gutho as a fullback and I do go, fuck, I wish we had that upside of like a Blaze or someone playing there. But, mate, like just his effort plays throughout a game, you just can't question them. And he's to chat and everything. What, what do you reckon, Timmy? Yeah, I – Gutho's my number one for sure, mm. moving forward. Blaze Tongue has such a big future, but I'm with you. I just, I've just i got such a high opinion of Clint Gutherson. I think his ball playing out the back is terrific. He gets through his metres. He does all the dirty work. His clean-up work is outstanding. I'm with you. I think he's underappreciated. But I think there's every chance he's come back from injury a little bit early this year, and despite running the metres, maybe he's lost an ounce of pace at the moment and he's playing because they're battling, but... I have such high opinion of Gutho and I'd be keeping him at one. I'd be keeping certainly Blaze Slung in the side. Defensively, there's going to be a couple of issues, but I think he's found for now a home on the wing. I think if moving forward, especially he's so young, he's going to get Super bigger, young. he's going to grow into his body. Mm. With every game Venerelli plays, he'll, he'll get more and more used to, to tackling men. And if Mitchie Moses or Dill Brown are off on, well, Moses on origin duties or there's injuries, Maybe you can just slot him in at 5'8", but I think on the wing as a young bloke learning under Gutho, I think it's a good spot to be. Yeah, so like uh, there's been kind of growing calls of like they may have to <clears throat> not reassign Gutho to put Blaze back there. But look, granted, I, I understand why Blaze would feel like, mate, I'm ready to play fullback. I want to play for I get it. You know, we've all been there. Mm. But at the same time, like play your trade for, just for another year or two under Gutho on the wing mm. and then – Depending how things go, you you know, as Gutho gets a little bit older, you move to fullback and he moves to centre. Because I tell you what, the pressure on Blaze, let's say they did move Gutho on, even like before <laughs> this year. They moved him on this year, heading into next year with Riles. The pressure for a young fella at Parra Eels to take up after Gutho, because not only do you have to play extremely well, but Gutho is one of the most consistent fullbacks in the competition. That's what you're, you're going to have to replace. It's a tough, tough gig. He's got the talent. He's got the talent. But if I would be it, waiting another year or two. If Gutho was to like move on and it was to happen, they went, no, we're going all in on Blaze. Mm. As good as Blaze is going to be, I think it'd be one they'd just regret and go, holy crap, we underappreciated this bloke, yeah, what I, he does. And that's the thing. There are growing kind of talks about what will rise. Gutho is the number one you know, situation. But me personally, I, I think that's... I, I have I questions about certain members of this team and like how badly they want to be there, how badly they want to win, all these sorts of things. And Gutho is the last bloke on yep. that list. Agreed, agreed. So we'll see. It's going to be interesting because I do think I do think Riles is going to be tapping some bloke on the shoulders, mm. heading in. And well, on. he has to. Yeah. It's an underperforming roster for a few years. He's yeah. going to go in there and there's an, there are enough good footballers in there that doesn't need to be a full clean out, but there's going to be a lot moved on. Yeah. Um, all right, anything else on the Eels, boys? No. Uh, also, don't forget, golf on KO. The Open Championship is on KO. Over 60 hours of live content throughout the tournament. Live and exclusive to Fox Sport, available on KO. There's plenty of room for everyone, so get on board with KO. Now also available on Hubble. Dragons defeat the Broncos. Uh, don't forget, guys, we're giving $1,000 cash away. Just got to do the survey. Uh, in the show notes, take you five minutes and you've got a chance to win one of $500 cash prizes and it really, really helps the show. And also Monday, 6 p.m., the green and, gold, green and gold drop is happening. That is next Monday, 6 p.m. Dragons defeat the Broncos 30-26. to 26. What an outstanding win from the Dragons. They go up to Suncorp against a desperate Broncos. They don't have Ben Hunt. They don't have Lomax. 
and they get the job done. And granted, yes, the Broncos, they fought back into the match towards the end there, but the match was essentially over um, pretty much before halftime. Uh, an incredible win from the Dragons. And I tell you what, I don't care what happens from now on out for the Dragons. This season is a success for me. Like, it is a tick. It's a massive improvement. And I'll tell you something that really haunted my dreams. Watching that game. So, Tui Pilotu scores the first try. Gets up, yipping and yahoo. And I'm like, you know what? He scored a try. That's all good. Then he's yipping and yahoo on every try he scores. And it's starting to sting. And I'm going, <laughs> this... I'm such a fan of Tui Pilotu. Anyone who watches his podcast knows he's manly. When he was at Manly, huge fan. Surprised that they got rid of him. Every time someone scored, he was yipping and yahooing and getting people, doing all that. And so it was stinging me. And I was like, this guy, man, he won't, this guy he won't stop. He's hurting every time, but I like him so much. Anyway, so I go to bed. I wake up next morning. I got a notification on my phone. The first notification is Tui Pilotu started following you. And I said, this guy's fucking haunting me. This guy's fucking haunting me. He will not stop taking the piss out of me. Um, all jokes aside, he was, he was outstanding. Yahoo in your DMs I or? think so. He yeah. sent me a picture of him just going like that. Yeah, fuck. Um, all jokes aside, he was phenomenal. Uh, the Dragons were phenomenal. And they got DNA. They're building culture. They look like an... 12 months ago, they were the, the least exciting side to even talk about. Fast forward 12 months to today, and they're, for me, they're one of the best sides that I like talking about. There's so much going on. Flanagan is such an enjoyable, from a purely entertainment coach to, to, to cover, he's great. What a win from the Dragons, and as I said, regardless of what happens from here on out, it is a massive tick. I think they've made so much progress, incredible win. Just on Tua Pilotto, how good was uh, when Moses Sully scored and he went to kick the ball as a try celebration, he sort of charged him down. Yeah, <laughs> so he falls over, still gets up and gives it to the crowd. It's like, man, nothing was going to stop him. Just on that, Moses Sully, I thought he had a huge game mm. in this one. He was fantastic. And I thought uh, Kyle Flanagan down on the edge, I thought his ball playing was sensational. I think they did a lot of homework on Stags during the week and how he defends and whatnot. And uh, just some... So some plays you could tell that they had them planned all week to try and get at Stags there. Mm. Yeah, it was it was a masterclass by Shane Flanagan. And, I, you know, I don't think Flanagan gets enough credit for how crafty he is with his coaching at times. Yeah. Like, tactically, he's actually quite brilliant. Um, they tore the Broncos' right edge apart and they just <laughs> kept going back there, kept going back there. Um, it was almost hard for them not to score when they went mm. um, down that edge. What do you think of the, the Dragons, Timmy? Yeah, it's that man, Sully. He's just been – I've spoken about it a few times this season, but I think he's been one of the most underappreciated players all season. And, and I think the reason for that is because he's playing on the left edge and because Ben Hunt and Zach Lamish on the right edge, so much of the attacking ball goes down there. The left edge outside flat, I just don't see a lot of it. So he's probably not getting the tries, the try assists that sort of get the attention, but – just his all-round game, mate. He had some really soft hands for for that first try of Tui Pilotu. Defensively, I, I think I brought up a similar stat a couple of weeks ago, but he's missed 12 tackles in 15 games this season. He's missed multiple tackles in only two games this season. That was two and three tackles. He's missed six tackles in his last nine games. I think he's been tremendous. Yeah, he's been outstanding. And it's just... What's been so impressive is how well-rounded his game been. Like, mm. we all know Suli is a barnstorming centre that can, you know, storm over, barnstorm over the try line, bump blokes, take carries out of his own end. He's one of the best centres carrying the ball out of his own end in the competition. But it's, as you just said, it's all the little things. It's the oh. soft hands. It's the, it's the defensive reads. It's the one-on-one -on -one battles that he has. Very rarely do you watch Suli defend against an opposite centre and walk away going, oh, Suli just got a bath. Like, doesn't really happen that often. He's devastating. Like, his defensive reads as well have yeah. been excellent. He, yeah, huge, huge year for him. It's one of my favourite stories in rugby league from the last few years, mm. Sully, where he's come from to where he is now. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I thought Little was outstanding. Geez, I, I hope they – and look, Flanagan's getting into those areas of just like, don't doubt him, don't doubt him. Because I, Cook comes to the club and I go, oh, how are they going to make this work? I just back Flanagan. He's just going to make it work, this Cook-Little combination, because – Surely Little keeps his spot in the 17. You'd have to say so. I think so. Yeah, he's been unreal. And so, like, this Cook-Little combination in the middle, little it's, it's Little's running game to me that's been the most impressive. Mm. And if you've got two guys, him and Cook, running like that, their ruck speed is going to be 
out of this world. Talk to the centres. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Might like, take silly spot. In all seriousness, like jokes aside, with Damien Cook for South Sydney over the last few months, like he is so versatile as well. Yeah, he is. Like he can cover like all, all the jokes aside about centre and whatnot. Yeah. Whenever he's forced to play somewhere else, he does it at a very high click. Mm. Well, he he comes through the grades as a fullback wing. Yeah, he did. But even like there's a few times he sort of played a bit of like a thirteen role, and he's been great there as well. I wonder whether yeah. that's where he's looking at thirteen. Yeah. Kind of Watson sort of style. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Maybe and kind of play a 13 9 role. Well, yeah. Even if you were to just have them both in the 17 and like it just, like you could just use Cook in a few different ways there as well. I, I don't I, mind I him at 13. A, a really good one two punch, though. I don't, I don't mind the kind of Watson uh, cheese combination, kind of, mm. where you bring them on and you can have them on both at the same time and Eisenhuth gets a rest for X amount of minutes. I actually don't mind that. Um, Just on uh, Little Flanagan and Suley, probably those blokes probably having their best season, either in a couple of seasons or, or ever. Fair to say, mate. Flanagan, I thought he was pretty good first year at the Roosters. Yes. Yeah, yep. Um, but outside of that, and obviously his debut year at the Sharkies. Outside of that, it's probably yeah. Flanagan's best year. I think it's. I think. Roosters year was good in a stack yeah. side. What he's doing here is incredible. Yeah. Well, I just, that probably just comes back to the uh, we've hammered on about it a bit, but good coaching. Like you know, he's, he's getting the yeah. best out of a couple of these guys who, you know, could have gone either way there for a little while. But um, yeah, they're they're definitely on the right track, aren't they, the Dragons? It just shows you like certain coaches just do well with certain players. Yeah. You know, and and so you know, it's just the way it is. And and obviously Flano, his dad, he knows him the best, so he understands his son, what makes mm. him tick, what makes him doesn't. But you know, even guys like. You know, I know we had a, a Barry Crocker in defence, but Sloan, like the fact that they've even re-signed Sloan has yeah. been incredible. And, and as you said, like certain coaches with certain players, like I wouldn't have expected Sloan to be one of those certain sort of players with him. No, nah, no. Nah. I, I thought that was destined for disaster. Oh, I thought it was honest. going to be. i tell you what, though. Got to speak about it, though. Sloan's defence, holy, like, mate. <laughs> just, you got to rip in there. you got to rip in. I. Yeah, he nearly, honestly, he nearly lost in the game. Like, if he had made... Two of the four tackles on his line, then like that, they wouldn't have been close. So he's got to sort yeah, that. I do think the a hundred percent like goal line defence and last man D not good from him. There was the one was it the Ezra Man try? The small bloke in the line. Granted, I know Ezra's pretty small as well. The contact was alright. He had him for a long time. He had no support. He was holding him there for about three seconds yeah. before Ezra crashed up. It's like I think it was whoever was on the outside of him shot up and he, and Sloan just sitting there going, boys, give yeah. us some help. Yeah. But yeah, he's got to sort that out because if they want to make a run to the finals, which they, man, I, I just, I cannot give them enough wraps. I really can't. They're currently sitting in ninth, ninth um, and they've got, so they're actually, you know, with a game in hand compared to the doggies and the dolphins, they're actually sitting equal points to the dolphins and the, do, um, and the doggies, which is like phenomenal. We're talking mm. about a team that everyone had for the wooden spoon. Yeah, it has been incredible, absolutely bit of, incredible. Bit of value, three fifty to make the eight, sitting ninth at the moment. I I really enjoy watching them play footy too. That's yep. what's been most surprising with me. Like their style of footy, it's a little bit in your face on the the line, but not so much that it becomes unlikable. Um, you know, and also every time, every little win they have, they are yipping and yahooing. Mate, some of the shape they were running on that left edge off Luciano Le Lua on the weekend was outstanding. Isn't he? He's just like this. You put him out there and just – he's just a, a fountain of possibilities. You I, know I, I mean? had – I didn't have – sorry, I had him in my team of the week. I think a few boys – can't remember we ended up with, but Sewell was throwing him out there. He didn't um, pad the stat sheet, but he had like an early pass or a wraparound over in a few of the tries. He was integral to it. Well, he, he's just – as I said, he's a fountain of opportunities. Mm. Like when you just give him the ball and something is going to happen. Yeah. He's got such a wide range of skill set – Super powerful, great footwork, incredible ball playing for how big he is. That things just seem to happen around him. Um, he's been out. He's another guy. Like, you know, goes comes down from the Cowboys, and a lot of people are saying that he's getting paid massive overs for the huge contract that he got. But mate, he's been great. Yeah. Well, I, I said the left edge of the Dragons don't get a ton of attacking opportunity in particular. Nearly everything they do is down the right edge. But we saw this week that when Flano is running the shit with Ben Hunt out. Tui Plotto on the left wing scores a hat trick and that left edge. Like Flano yeah. was in everything. Yeah. He, that awesome floater for Tui Plotto, he was the one that isolated. It was um, Sully on whoever it might Ricky. have been. Ricky, Ricky brilliant. Um, and you know what? They played exactly the way the Broncos should have played. You know, mm. high completion rate, mm. really tough, really gritty, 
um, energetic, line speed, a lot of line speed at the start of the game. Like if you go back and watch it and you compare the Dragons' line speed compared to the, the Broncos' line speed, it's, it's for the start of the game, it's literally night and day. Um, so, yeah, Dragons, outstanding performance. They, uh, they have a bye this week, so they've got two weeks to prepare for what I think is going to be a three weeks that will define this season. Penrith, Melbourne, Canterbury. I don't, if they were to go through That doggy's game is going to be interesting. Mm. Well, yeah, but mate, with two weeks to prepare against Penrith at Wynn Stadium. I'm more looking at it from the doggies because they'll be taking points from each other around yeah, yeah, that yeah, area. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. 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 But you just like, you, you don't want it to get to that dogs game and they're back in 13th or whatever, which can happen in this competition very quickly, especially how close everyone is. But man, if they can find a way to jag two out of these three games. And doggies will be huge. coming off two Brisbane games, sorry, two Queensland games in a row as well. Yeah. Um, I thought DeBellin was good again. He's really found a home in the front row. Jeez, it suits him. Uh, obviously playing 13 for a lot of his career, but Flanagan's just gone and said, nah, you're an out and out front row. And it's been outstanding for him. Well, if you go back and listen last year, whenever Flano was commentating on the Dragons, he used to absolutely give it to DeBellin at 13. <laughs> Didn't hold back at all. It was, uh, yeah, he was very outspoken about it. So it hasn't shocked me at all to see him moving to the front row, but he's playing great for you. He's been there. outstanding, yeah. outstanding. Um, good to see Jack Bird back, back on the field. Um, another guy like I know his, his stats aren't the best but Francis Molo just just if you w- actually watch the game and don't worry about stats he has these like l- like little big plays if you know what I mean I know it sounds contradicting but these like little moments that they don't make the highlight real but they almost swing momentum to a degree it might be a little a big shot might be a great run He's, he's one of those guys you've just got to watch closely to see how much he offers. As Molo boys, they've just always got had something about them, haven't yeah, they? Yeah, so always. it's been great. Jesse Maskey at seven, like... <laughs> I like Maskey. Like, he just rips and tears. Yeah. He just rips and tears. Like, yeah, really, really good win. Um, I'll tell you what, Ravalawa coming out of his own end, watching blokes having to tackle him, you can, you can see them cringing going, this fucking hurts, this hurts. So big and strong. Um, so, yeah, look, really, really good win from the Dragons and... Uh, outstanding year. Very quickly, Jaden Sewer as well, uh, obviously dropped from the Origin side, but that's that's the way you want to respond when you get dropped from one of those sides. He, I thought he had a great game as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, On to the Broncos. Um, look, there's no real other way to sugarcoat it. Extremely disappointing. Uh, for me personally, the most disappointing part wasn't actually the loss. It was the fact that we came out, got blown off the park, then decided to go, oh, the game's nearly out of our hands. Let's turn up the um, intensity. Mm. And then as soon as they turned up intensity, they wiped the, no, uh, the Dragons off the park. Like pretty much Dragons couldn't hold a candle to them. And I know some people go, oh, well, that's good. Like they came back. But for me, it's frustrating. It's like, why wasn't that at the start of the game? And unfortunately, I, I just, I watch a team that is okay. They don't look like they're stressed out about the situation they're in. There's a little bit of frustration clip creeping in here or there. I think Ezra Mann, you can tell he's getting a bit frustrated. Um, but they don't look like a desperate side to me. They don't look like a side that is understanding the gravity of the situation. Now, granted, maybe internally it is like that, but externally, when they came out in the field and played the way they played in that first 40 minutes, didn't look like a desperate side to me. Completely agree with you, mate. And I agree. It's frustrating at the back end to see the way they did play because you, you now two wins out of the top eight. Like, the season's essentially over. Oh, I, I think the season is over now. I, I can't see them making the top eight now. I know, I know you're, you're pretty high on them for the run home, but mm. they've, I think they're going to have to win six from seven, maybe five from seven if a lot of things fall their way. But I think it's six from seven. I'm just not seeing it with this side yet. Like, did that look like a team that was playing for their season? Like not at all. When they should be. They should be playing for their season. And that's the question. Can they turn on a lot? <coughs> I like... I think they will because they're desperate and they're on the verge of being embarrassed by, you know, going from the grand final and very close to a premiership to not even making the eight. And it looks that way. Their draw on the run home is pretty soft. They have a bye to come. I just think when you get Walsh, Haas, Carrigan in particular back, firing, playing for top eight spot, I can see them, on, them going on a big run. Even if they do that, though, how much is it going to take out of them getting to, to get into finals? Um, that being said, nothing they've done over the last five, six weeks has said that they will do that. Mm. I just think there's a good enough football team in there and the desperation that those boats are going to bring back next week. Mm. 
I think they can do it. If they play, like Kevin Walters has said, he's, he can't guarantee that they'll back they up. I think if I, they get through unscathed, I think they have to play. Yeah, now. I think they have to as well. Look, I, I agree with you. They, they, they have the team, absolutely. I don't think that you put a line through them at the moment and say, nah, they're mm -hmm. done, they're completely over. But I would say of a probability factor, it's more than likely that they won't make the eight. Agreed. agreed. Because even with their players back, mate, it's six in a trot. Like mm. they've had their full strength side outside of Adam Reynolds and they've lost games. Like it's it's been so disappointing. So, so disappointing. Isn't it amazing? Like if they do miss the eight this year, you know, they'll be the second team in a row to make the grand final and miss. And the team before that, that Penrith played in the grand final was South Sydney, who have now probably missed the finals two out of three years. It just shows you how friggin' unbelievable what Penrith are doing. Yeah. Like it's actually in, like insane what they're doing. Especially when you consider the team before that that lost the grand final was Penrith. Yeah. Insane. Yeah. Um, look, Jensen was good. He ripped and teared as much as he could, um, but he can only do so much. Uh, I thought Moza had his best game in first grade. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that he was really, really good. Uh, great service. Obviously, that try was good as well. Um, but Wilson, pretty good. Yeah. It's, ha it's hard to be too positive because, again, like, it was, what was it, 22 nil or something like that at one stage? Like, mm -hmm. absolute tailing. Um, unfortunately, Tristan Saylor, I, I just don't think he's a first grader at the moment. Um, I think he, need, he needs to develop his game in New South Wales Cup for quite a bit before he comes back into first grade. Now, maybe they don't have anyone else to select there, but I think he's been given a pretty fair opportunity to prove that mm. he is NRL standard at this stage in his career, and I don't think he's yeah. there yet. He's been a bit disappointing. Like, we know the talent's there, the ability's there, but we sort of sat there for a while and said, why hasn't he played a, a bit more NRL in, in sort of the last couple of years? And... He's still very raw, but he's also not a spring chicken. He's not 19, is he? Yeah, like, he's not. Um, what do you make of the bench of the Broncos? And I haven't looked at availability in squad, and you know they were missing a few, but what I think they were missing from their pack, Hassan Carrigan to origin, but two hookers and Carapani in a an outside back. Weird bench. Yeah, I don't know. I, I the only thing I can think of is a decimator with injury. It nearly have to be because. Um, like who else? And, Outside and of the Origin boys, they're missing Reynolds. They're not missing that much. They're are missing they? Takura, Reynolds. Um, uh, yeah, it's and not not too many. I wouldn't have thought, but mm. I don't know what's happening there. I don't know. From a team that in the process, and it felt like they had all the players in the world. Yeah. Too many forwards. Like yeah. it, their depth outside. The only depth that we were concerned about was Erich. But like even like Hunt can't get back on the bench. And although he wasn't, he wasn't great when he played first grade. He wasn't terrible either. Uh, go go Asaki or whatever. Um, Koseski, he's injured. Yeah. yeah. Is Fletcher Baker injured? Yes, he's injured. Yeah, okay, so there's a few there. There's a few injuries. That would make up the bench, probably. Yeah. Koseski and, and Fletcher Baker and Takora, maybe. So, like, yeah, some few injuries, but that doesn't, I mean, doesn't change much. We, we've me. seen the baby Broncos through the origin period as recently as last year. The club generally thrives off and they go, all right, here's, here's a chance to show our depth and to get up and, you know, cause boil over. It's not that this was a boil over the other way, but... They've obviously lifted for it. They lifted for it last year, obviously in a better year, but disappointing. Mate, that, that right side defence needs to, whatever system, like this shooting out of the line for no reason, I don't understand where this has come from. And, mate, concerningly there, outside of Rogers, like it was, was it Ricky, Staggs and Arthurs, those three, they're the regular spots. So that's not injury or origin impacted Just, outside of Rogers. You know, Staggs with a silly 10 in the bin, like he's way too experienced to do that. And then his read in the first try, you go back to last week, it was the exact same situation. He shot up when he, mm. he didn't need to. Because in that first try, like, if he just gets up and slides, they yes, they lose a few metres, but they still, he's got the speed to cover. So whatever system's going on in that right side needs to get sorted because we're just getting torn apart on it. Um, well, uh, yeah, if your right side's struggling, you get a big test this weekend. Newcastle, KP, yeah. Brabham, Best, Miles, you. Oh, boy. Hopefully the boys can bounce back. Um, look, they set themselves up for an incredible story right now. If they can go on an incredible run, wouldn't that be awesome? But it's been really disappointing. And, and uh, you know, if they – all that good work that they did last year and everything they've done to get out of the hole they have been as a – we've been as a club since 2020, geez, you can get a race quickly. So hopefully they can turn it around because it's um, – yeah, it's disappointing. I know the Knights just got absolutely flogged, but with all those players back, they're $2.30 against Brisbane at home this week. Mm. Yeah. I reckon, I personally think 
we'll at least see a big response from the Broncos this weekend and the next weekend with all their players in. Mm. It's just a matter of can they do it for seven weeks, eight yeah. weeks? I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but, yeah, hopefully they're hurting because I know their fans are hurting and uh, they're, they're better than this. They, they are the ones that have proven that they're better mm. than this. So I'll back them all the way, but it has been very, very disappointing. Um, okay, Manly defeat the Knights 44-6. to six. What a performance from Manly. When you talk about game plans getting executed across the weekend, this was the game, in my opinion, where it was almost a perfect execution of a game plan. Um, you know, we've already spoken about Hopawati, how good he was. Sa- Saab was great on the other side. Um, Garrick had one of his best games at centre, in my opinion. Uh, Tommy Turbo looked good at the back. I guess we'll talk about it quickly. I'm just unsure about what the thinking is. Like, So they put him in at centre for last week's game. And then they put Cooler at the back. Cooler gets injured and they go, all right, we're going to put Tommy back. What I'm not understanding there is that like, so if Cooler wasn't injured, would he still be centre? Or was it always we're only putting him in at centre at one game just to get him through it and then we put him at fullback? Because outside looking in, I, I just I would love to have a conversation with Siebes and just go like, what's was it, is this part of the plan? Or was this just a reaction to Cooler getting injured? Because I'm, I'm still unsure. I don't have much to add. I've got no idea what's going on there. I think I think you sort of summed it up well before too. And you said that like Turbo was back, but he did a lot of that through his ball playing. Mm. He's still not moving overly freely. Mm. And that's it. It's like, did they see enough in the first week back at centre to go, no, no, you're right to, if it was going to be two or three weeks at centre, Caller went down, all right, let's get him to full back. But said it was his ball playing mm. tore the night's edges apart. And like, <clears throat> to call it what it is, as good as Manly were, like... They had Dylan Lucas at centre, who's awesome, but he's also a back rower. Thomas Kant, a back rower at centre. New wingers, what, Mapapalangi, Marju was still there. He was on one leg, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had that, it was a heavy court from, like, midway through the first half or something. So, like, it wasn't a Tommy necessarily tearing apart with his running game. <coughs> so, mm. it, I don't really understand it either. See, I thought what they were going to do was, because they carried uh, Falolo, I thought they were going to bring... Falolo, if, if the game was won, they were going to bring Falolo on and then they're going to move Hopawati to the fullback and take Tommy off. Well, Garrick, granted it happened about the 64th, 65th minute, I reckon Tommy would have been just about to have a spell, then Garrick went off holding his jaw or something. Yeah, because he, he didn't kick the goal before he went off to <coughs> Humphreys did, so I'd, yeah. there must have been something. With something was, I don't know what it is. I mean, I'm finding him, but... Like, even still, yeah, I would have taken... Like, when they were, you know... 15 to go when the game was done. I would have gotten Tommy off immediately. I couldn't believe as well. Like, there's all this chat about him playing centre. So where, you know, you're going to get more footy out of him. About five minutes before they made that substitute, he kicked the ball from about his own 40. He did a bit of kicking. As well, yeah. yeah. And I was sort of just like, it's hard to work out. Do you have the science that said he should be at centre? Yeah. Is, that, is that a one-week thing? Are we... Uh, well, the good, Lehigh the good. was great at fullback when he played there. It's Good thing is, he's back. And yeah. even, even at 80%, he's unbelievable. It's actually a joke. At 80%, he just won Team of the Week pullback. Mm. Would have been Incredible. very interesting if he was back a week earlier than what he was. Like, if he had that sort of performance before you're picking an origin side. Very interesting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Could you imagine? Um, so, yeah, Manly, outstanding. I thought Humphrey was really good. He's mm. not... When you watch him go to the line and square the defence up, he doesn't look as comfortable as, like, an Adam Reynolds or whatever. But... He still just kind of gets it done. Like, it is, he has a quite a unique... Like, even one of the, the try, I think, that he scored, backing up through the middle, which was, honestly, it could have been five metres forward. <laughs> well, you, said, you said a minute ago when he goes to the line, I was going to say, what about when he goes five metres in front of the line? <laughs> <laughs> he, looked, he looked pretty dangerous there Yeah, he well. finds a way to make it work. Yeah, he makes it work. <laughs> so he doesn't look as comfortable as you would, like, see an Adam Reynolds or, like, even a Katoa, but he still squares the defence up. He still gets it done. And I think that what's going to be interesting, if he does go to the Rabbitohs, if it's all sorted, what's going to be interesting, he's a nuggety body. Like, he's ball running. He'll be someone that's going to be hard to handle because he is so looks like he's so strong in contact. I'm, I'll, I'm excited to see how his career pans out, whether he ends up at six or seven. They thought he was a nine. Then, obviously, they got the injuries. They put him at seven. Um, I wonder whether, because Manly said that he's a nine, that's why he's leaving the club. I'm not sure. But I, I want to see more of Humphreys. He looks... <coughs> he looks the goods. Looks like a very good fourteen to me for South Sydney next year. Yeah, really fit there. I mean, he was great in the, it. Was trials he trialed for at fourteen for a bit. He started at seven. Also, head of hair on him, doesn't yeah. he? He looked like he uh, put on a bit of size since we saw him in the preseason. Big as well. legs. He looked yeah, a bit more nuggety. Um, so yeah, he was great. Well, we, got that we, we, we'd sat there 
all season, haven't we? Going, why haven't we seen him yet? Why haven't we seen him? There was ample opportunities to get him in there and get him a run, whether it was at six, nine, fourteen, and he didn't disappoint. Like he couldn't have had a better debut. But they at seven in his debut, and they towered the Knights up forty-four mm. to six, and he was their seven. So um, in reserve grade, he's played ten games at five eight, nine games at halfback, four games at hooker, and then six off the bench. I tell you what, don't if he don't get too discouraged about if he does turn into the ultimate 14. Because in today's game, the 14 is like, it's not the most important, obviously, but the importance of a 14 in today's game with how many injuries and all the head knocks and everything, it's way, way more important than it used to be 10 years ago. It could be that very similar sort of career trajectory to uh, Connor Watson from the halves to he's now playing hooker, he's playing a bit of a 13. It's it's what got him an origin start. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If, If Connor Watson was just a little bit better and stayed in a six or seven jersey or just a six jersey, he wouldn't have played. He probably wouldn't have played Origin. No. But it's the fact that he is the perfect 14. And you look at Humphreys, like his body shape is a perfect for it. Now, granted, he may come out and be an awesome seven or six, but, you know, times have changed. That 14 jersey uh, sometimes is not mu- as much of a curse as it used to be where you'd be like, oh, shit, I'm a bench player. I only get a certain amount of minutes. Sometimes 14s are playing like 60 minutes every single week. Isn't it wild how, like, it was really not that long ago. Like, I remember, um, oh, I can't remember who the player was, but I, I, I did a post two or three years ago where I wanted, like, an origin player to come off the bench for impact. And I remember just the comments were absolutely flooded with, he's too good to be on the bench, you bench for the shit players. Mm. Like, it's just been flipped <laughs> on its head. Yeah. Like, it used to almost be an insult for guys to be on the bench. Well, it was like, you pick your best 13, like, Form-wise or like uh, ability-wise, and then the the bench was just guys that weren't as good. Yeah. But are you telling me that like a guy like Spencer Lenu isn't as good when he gets on the field yeah. as a Jake Trevojevic in Origin at the moment? Like, the game's just been broken down into like four twenty-minute games within yeah, it, and pretty you've got to win each mm. of them. Pretty much. Um, so yeah, Humphrey was great. Brooks did his job. Um, Tommy Talao, how good's he been? Like we, I watched him in the trials, and he looked fitter than he'd ever looked, and I was, I thought he was on he was going to be on for a big year, but Mate, he's played so good that you can't get him out of that back line now. Like, even if they're at full strength, he has to be in that back line somewhere. Uh, yeah, and there's no like, there's no questioning it. Like, uh, I think with a lot of these sides and you're trying to find spots with guys, the first thing you do is, okay, we'll move a winger out of the side, but you can't drop him. I think Saab's been tremendous this year too. been so good. He's starting to really develop Saab. I, what I like about Saab is, like, I think there became a point in his career where he had two options. Yeah, he could be the guy with all this potential and he could find a contract with the club because every mm. club would sign him purely on his physical attributes. Or he could round out his game and become everything he should be. And I think I think he's chosen that path. He's rounded out his ball carrying. Like, yeah, okay, does he have an area here or there? Yes, he does still. But his defence has gotten way better. His ball carrying has gotten way better. He makes. He also is really good when he makes a line break and making the right decision to like pass or not pass now or like i remember at the start of his career like he almost like a bit like Cam Pereira, where he'd just kick immediately just bump kick or something like that whereas I, I know it was forward but he nails every opportunity he gets nine out of ten times he's nailing it i feel it like days. manly's entire back five are unbelievable once they make that line break just summing up the situation and finishing it they're some of the best at it seriously like, like Saab gets right just about every time when he goes through they do it whether it is a kick, whether it's back inside. On top of that, their support play, not only Tom Trebojevic, but their support play when a break is made is second to none in yeah, general. there's always three or four of them yeah. there all the way through. They to, just queue up. You know, under the post. Like Cherry Evans on yep. top of it, awesome <clears throat> support player. Yep. Seven line breaks in two weeks for Sal. Mate, he's, yeah, he's been outstanding. And, and I still think, I think he's like 23 or 24. There's still so much growth in him. Like, mate, he could... He, he could be one of those guys that in four or five years, we are, we are still, he's still kind of progressing because of it, because he's so physically big. Sometimes those kind of players take a little bit longer to just kind of grow into their body. And so we could be looking in four or five years where he genuinely could be pushing for a spot on the wing in origin. Like it's, it's not out of his possibility physically. It may be a slow burn, but if he keeps progressing like this and adding extra parts to his game, like why not? Yeah, why not? I completely agree. I reckon this year, just more the more I watch him, the, the more I start to think that he will be there one day. Because, mate, once he if once he fully gets his balance and what, how old is he? Mate, but when he, he's twenty three and this is his sixth season. Oh. When I, when I met him, like when you see him in person, 
his physical stature is like honestly shocking. Like it's it's different to seeing it on TV. Twenty three. Yep. Ah, uh, yeah, twenty three. I was just gonna say, like, I was in the room when he was there as well. It's the most blown away I've ever I've ever been about like meeting a rugby league player. Like I, the physic- I couldn't he's, believe he's, it. He's unbelievable, like a specimen, like an absolute specimen. Um, so yeah, gonna be. I cannot wait to see him develop. Um, in regards to the forwards, I thought Sipley was uh, much better, um, but Nathan Brown. I mean, we speak about him every week, but bargain by the season, seriously. Yeah. Bargain by Brown. <laughs> <laughs> Get the merch uh, printed and let's go. Let's go. <laughs> but Brown, it's not just what he brings um, statistically or whatever. I think he's brought an hard edge that this forward pack has been missing for a few years now. Yeah. You know, we go back to their their best years and you've got like Watt Mouse in there and, you know, the Stewart brothers or and Stewart. And I, I do feel for a couple of years over the last few years, they have missed that hard edge forward. Because like Manly used to be known for that. Like, I know, I know times have changed and they're definitely much less like everyone hates manly side, but that hard edge is what used to make them so special. Like they used to train out of the worst facilities in the competition. They were the underdogs, had no resources, but they loved that shit. They were old school. And that's what I think Nathan Brown brings is that old school, everybody hates manly kind of mentality. And I think it works. I loved in this game, Newcastle went in there with, you know, most of their outside backs gone. It was Greg Mars who was the big threat coming out of the end. Nathan Brown got up and went, okay. Yeah. I'm going to put this guy in a body bag. Here. <laughs> yeah. He just absolutely gave it to him. and he, he was on one one leg for the rest of the game with the back of that hit. Just being aggressive. Just yeah. just looking at the the one guy that's the, the trendsetter for every single set, which is Marju for the Knights, and said, I'm going to target you. Old school. That's an old school tactic. And just do whatever I can to make you not want to run the ball again. I thought his ball playing was unreal too in this game. I, I kind of – and I, I, know, I know it's only one game. I've always been a – Huge fan of Brownie. I kind of prefer him as that link man over Gerbo, to be honest with you. I think Gerbo is an out and out front rower, and yeah. I think he, I feel that way for a few years now. And I think it's actually it wasn't his fault. I feel like for many years he was used as the battering ram and having to make all those tackles that he his body just got so banged up. Like if you go back and watch old Gerbo coming through the grades, like he was so silky. His movement was great. I just think he's at a stage in his career now where I I think he's more of a front rower, um, especially at Clubland. So I agree with you, mate. I wouldn't mind Nathan Brown playing 13 each week. I'd love to see it. I well, think it'd be really effective. Because then also you've got... Especially while like Paseca and these boys are out, I reckon it'd be perfect. Perfect. But what do we talk about? The concern with Manly sometimes is they've, they're full pack too big and not mobile enough. If you've got Brown out there at 13, yep. like he can do all the cleanup work if he has to. Yeah. Um, on the weekend, he had 20 runs, 183 metres, 57 post contact, tackle break, 34, uh, 31 tackles. Um, great, great knock. That thing you said just then where he uh, targeted Marju, goes, that's the guy that gets him going. I'm going to have a crack at him. He's done that a few times this year quite well. He did it Fisher Harris. He, Henrith. Yeah, yep. Fisher Harris. Like, plays that role quite well. He's done it really well. And it's just like that old school mentality. Like, yeah. there's, not, there's no stats in it or, or whatever. It's purely like, it's rugby league. Either you're going to stand over me or I'm going to stand over you. And he, he, I mean, he has a crack every week, that's for sure. And he just, like, his ball playing at 13, it just suits Manly so well because... I think they move the ball side to side as good as any team in the comp. I think they're the best at it. Yeah, Let's and because so much of their play is getting, you know, they attack, they attack out of their own half. Mm. They look to get their lightning quick wingers away. It is imperative that they have that good ball player in the middle. And Jake Schwartz does a good job of it. Nathan, Brown, he throws really flat, hard, fast ball out in front. He does it perfectly. So I'm, I'm with you. I'd even if it's not necessarily starting. Like, he played 80 in the middle on the mm. weekend, bring mm. him on, 25 in, and play him 55 straight sort of thing. Well, I'll put it this way. Even when uh, Jake Trevojevic is playing 13, like, his stats are stats similar to a front rower, mm. not a 13. Yeah. Whereas, like, you know, at the moment, Jake Trevojevic, he's not running for 183 metres in a game. And so putting Jake Trevojevic in front row... You keep him on the field for what he does, and that's he's a leader. He's all the intangible stuff. So you can get the best out of Jakey at front row. And look, if he wants to get in and ball play, he, he can. Like, it doesn't mean he can't. Mm. I personally would give it a crack. Now, maybe Nathan Brown, can he do this week in, week out, 80 minutes in the middle? Maybe not. I'm not sure. At the very least, I'd be bringing him on at 13 and keeping Jakey out on the field and putting him in, in front row. Yeah, but by no means do I want him playing 80 minutes a week. Every week. 50, 55, yep. 60. I reckon he's well and truly capable of that. Yeah. Um, really, really good win for. Didn't mind uh, Caleb Novelli. 
I think it's Novelli. Is that how you say it? I believe so. Um, I think he's good off the bench. Got through his work. Eight runs, 71 metres. Not bad. 23 tackles, only one miss. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, so, yeah, great win for the Seagulls. On to the Knights. Mixture of two things. Yes, they had a bunch of outs. Yeah, their edges, like, you know, people playing out of position. They had two edge back rollers in the centres. At the same time, though, I just thought their forward pack was just nowhere near the standard that they have set themselves. Um, you know, if, they, if you're going to get beat and it's going to be in the areas where you've got these rookies out of position, fair enough, but they got beaten everywhere. Like, they were handily beaten everywhere. Um, Knights are a similar team where it's very hard to judge because they go on these runs where they, they get these gritty, grindy wins and you go, okay, like, they're going to hang in there. That, and then they have performances like this where they just come out of nowhere and you go, like, where did this come from? This, this is a shocker. Um, what do you reckon? Uh, I'll be honest with you. I, uh, in particular, Thomas Carr, putting him at centre. Fuck, I thought that was unfair. Like, Tom Jenkins played reserve grade. What? The fuck? Yeah. Why, why wasn't he in the side? At centre. What? I had, had the exact same. Oh, I thought he was injured. Oh, mate. Nah, so I, I heard apparently he's been disappointing in reserve grade. Like, like, like oh, mate, you don't feed a second row to the Wolves like that against Turbo Garrick. <laughs> I, I think that's very unfair. But he's still a, like he still has played yeah. centre. That's and like Car- Carnes played centre in in reserve grade a couple of times. But I personally think he's an out and out back rower. I. And he, mate, he's got such a big career on him. I reckon he's going to be a really good player. I just thought it was very unfair. Well, some of the foot, like when he did get the ball in hand, some of the footwork he showed and explosiveness, like he looked like a yeah. handful. And I even, I mean, even on that edge, if you wanted to, like at least Kai Pierce Paul has played some centre over in the Super League. I, I, I sort of half expected them to swap those two. I just thought it was a very tough gig to put a kid out there who's only played one or two games over the last few years in the centres to mark Ruben Garrick at Brookvale Oval. With Marju, who notoriously. You know, yeah, not the best defensive yeah. wing at times. Like, I know he's improved it, but he has games where he kind of switches off. I, I did feel like he switched off a bit in this game, Marju. There was, I mean, granted, he, it's hard to trust a guy that's in his first game yeah. at centre, but yeah. On, oh, on top of that, once Marju was injured and was hopping around on one leg, like I definitely would have swapped them. Mm. And look, you know, it's Jenkins in. The, it's a redhead, hey? Yeah, from from, from uh, Penrith. Penrith. Yeah. So, like, let's say his defence hasn't been that great. And, New South Wales Cup, at least he's played centre quite a bit. You know, it's I'm, one game. It's one game. Season, put like. him in. He's played centre. Maybe this is the game where it's going to click for him. And also, like he was at Penrith as well. He can't be that bad in defence. Can't be so bad that you're putting a, an edge back row there. Mm. I just think, for the sake of a young guy like that, I just think it's unfair to do. I just, mm. um, isn't it interesting watching Will Price? He's so rough around the edges. He's so rough around the edges. He has these, you know, he definitely got some footy in him, but I think that he's going to do a, it's going to do him a massive world of good in another preseason with first grade. 100%. You know, you can see the talent, you can see the ability, just a lot of turnovers, a lot of, you know, there was, there was even a play where he got it on last and he sort of created something instead of just throwing the pass on the inside, he went for the one-hander mm. and um, <laughs> the ability's there. And to be honest with you, mate, I, I was pretty cr- you know, I was, I was surprised when he got this jersey a few mm. weeks ago, but he has been better than I thought he'd be. And I, I, I think defensively he's been pretty good. But, yeah, there's just a lot of rough edges there still. I think we're going to be having this conversation about him for the next two years and he'll be in and out of first grade, especially with a few halves to chop and change between from. Like Tyson Gamble, I think, is back next week as well. And then one day it's just all going to click to him mm. and he just understands the NRL. And it's, it might be two years away. Right? And when he does, I think he's going to be a gun. Mm. It's going to take time. I, when I watch him play, and I, granted, I don't watch a lot of Super League, but when I do, it's very attacking orientated. And I feel like it might take him a little bit of time to adjust, like, those risky plays that you can get away with in the Super League. Like, NRL, like, if you're having two errors a game, like, that's not good enough. Like, you've got to keep your error count really low, so that means you've got to risk a little bit less um, or at least pick your moments. Um, but, yeah, like, the talent is there. Some of his footwork around the ruck there when he was getting someone mm. off the ruck was outstanding. Yeah, I thought his kicking game was really good too. Mm. On his uh, fellow countryman, Kai Piss Paul, he's, we've thrown a lot about him this year. I, just, I get the idea he doesn't realise how strong and powerful he can be. Like, <laughs> he runs an all right line, mm. he works hard enough, it's all good and well, but he's just not punching the line as hard as he should be. 
That left edge at the Knights is such a good position to be in the NRL. Run off Jacko Hastings, who squares up well, <coughs> especially when KP's there out the back taking attention off you. I know he's been out recently, but he's physically outstanding, Kai Pierce Paul. And another bloke I think is going to have a big future in the NRL. I just want to see him really knuckle down and hit that hard unders line. See, I reckon he's having the opposite sit, like thought processes price mm. where he's being real conservative. Yeah. So, he's, for example, you look at his – he had obviously 11 runs, 82 metres, 37 tackles, zero misses. The amount of times where you can see him, his body shape, he almost goes like that to, do, to throw, and yeah. he just goes, nah. And so I wonder whether he's being taught, told to just get through your, your, your job each week. And probably, but I think he's done enough week in, week out this season to say, all right, I can handle the rigours of week to week NRL. I'm playing big minutes every week. I'm holding up in defence. I'm getting through my work. Let's add a little bit of flair to it. But Let's I, start I, looking for that offload. I think there's more. also the other side of it too, that he's got close to being dropped out of this side two or three times. But concerned. every time he does, there's an injury or a yeah. HIA or something happens that gets him back in there. I think he's scared I to make so errors too. in this side. I think Adam O'Brien, mm. the way it seems anyway, I think that he's being told to keep it safe and no errors yeah. and grindy footy. Which is fine. I, if, if you if, go watch his Super League highlights, there's like... Every it's chance flare he's everywhere. Get, he's just whatever he wants. And, and it's a credit to him that he's <coughs> stuck to the guns and, and stuck to his head. He's clearly been told mm. at times to you know, put the offload away. You don't need to be a flary player just yet. Um, I'd be getting back and I'd be looking at Lachlan Fitzgibbon highlights from recent years and just the way he played on that left edge at the Knights and how effective he was running just a hard straight line. It, like Pierce Paul, uh, uh, Pierce Paul, uh, like Will Price, I think he's going to explode at some point, but... Mate, the Knights need to win games, a few points in them. I think the time is just, if nothing else, get that arm going a little bit and just run a little bit harder because he's going to destroy blokes. Yeah. Oh, when, he, when it all clicks for him, man, I can't wait to see him just unleash. You know what? If he's going to run that hard line like that, I'm okay with an error or two. 100%, at least to begin yeah. with. Get, yeah. get him used to the timing, the contact. Look, there's been <clears throat> chopping and changes to a degree of halves pairing, so maybe that's a little bit. You know, mm. Hastings has been in and then Gamble has been in and then... You know, Price has been – granted, I know Hastings on his side, but Hastings hasn't been there the whole season either. Yeah. So maybe it's just him getting used to that timing off, off you know, maybe. Uh, yeah. players. Because um, I thought he was one of the few players that really ripped in yesterday. Um, uh, yeah, so really, really poor loss. Hopefully the boys can bounce back. Um, I think they – it's going to be tough for them because when a few players get publicly tapped on the shoulder like they have – it's very hard for those players to go, oh, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bleed for this team. Like, Ooh, I've yeah. just got told to. And also, like, these players are top-tier players. Like, they're not just rookies coming in. They're players that would have a lot of respect in the changing room, a lot of friends. So it's going to be hard. Interesting how they balance all of that. Um, but, yeah, really, really disappointing performance for the Knights. Um, all righty. Let's get into it. Let's face some music with some tips for uh, next week. Round 20. Keep it round 20. They grow up so fast, don't they? <laughs> already, at the, already around 20. Uh, Friday night football. One game this week uh, at GIO Stadium. Uh, the Raiders, $2.05 against the Warriors, $1.80. The line is one and a half points on Friday night. Oh, this is a tough one. I'm going to go the Waz. The Waz. back, we reckon? I believe Fogarty's going to be moved. And potentially Zach Hosking. <sighs> what time are you heading down? <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, that's tough. It's t- and it's eleven v twelve as well. Couldn't get any tighter, really. Okay, I will go. I'll go the Raiders, and I'll go Raiders one to twelve because it's obviously only one and a half points. Okay, yep. Sure. Yeah, I'll go Raiders one to twelve. Raiders one to twelve. I'm gonna go Raiders one to twelve. I'll go Warriors one to twelve. Okay. I'll take you on in that one. Then we go to Saturday. What a, what a big game this is. Matty versus me uh, up at Gosford. Um, Bunnies, $1.27. The Tigers, $3.80. 11 and a half is the line. Rabbits, rabbits. Rabbits, rabbits. Rabbits, rabbits. I'll go rabbits, give Tigers a start. I'm going to go rabbits, but I'll give Tigers the 11 and a half Ooh. point start. <laughs> he's giving up on his wow. team. Hey, hey, hey. We all saw what we saw. <laughs> <laughs> spend, I'll be realistic. Okay. Uh, Knights two dollars thirty against the Broncos a dollar sixty two line four and a half points uh, up at McDonald Jones. Um, Broncos Broncos. You know Broncos with the night start. Okay. Broncos Broncos. I'm gonna tip Newcastle. 
I'm going Broncos, Broncos. I think with those players back, mm. um, and you know, after Kevy's big bake as well, they'll be uh, they'll be showing up. Uh, Saturday night, we got the Storm two bucks, um, two dollars at home. The Storm against the Roosters a dollar eighty five. The line again, pretty short, one and a half points. <sighs> Jesus, what a, what a match! Holy. Um, Oh, Roosters one to twelve. Yeah, Chooks one to twelve. I reckon both teams are going to mass rest. I reckon the Roosters rest their Origin players, and I reckon Harry Grant doesn't play. I mean, go Storm. Okay, that's me. Me thoughts. Yep. I don't know. I, I'm thinking the opposite. I reckon they'll all play. You reckon? Yeah. I, and I think I've, I just got a feeling it's going to be Roosters thirteen plus. I tell you Ooh. what. For the game's sake, I hope they all back up because it's going to be a cracker. Yep. Um, geez, that is a tough one. I reckon I'm probably going to go. I'll go the Storm at home. Um, Storm one to twelve. Okay. Uh, I'll take the outsiders there. Then Sunday we have got the Panthers, a dollar twenty two. The Dolphins four dollars thirty. Twelve and a half is the line. Out at Penrith. Panthers, Panthers. Oh, I'll go Panthers, Dolphins. Yep. This is so hard with Panthers potential restings again, but I'll just go Panthers, Dolphins. I'll go. Panthers, Panthers. Do you reckon Panthers plays back up? But Cleary's been right? rested already. Cleary. Cleary's playing. I think Cleary's Cleary back. will be back. I reckon the rest of the Panthers rest. Okay. I'm going Panthers. I'll go the Dolphins with the start. Uh, Manly, $1.35. Host the Titans, $3.23. Eight and a half is the line. Back at Brookie. <laughs> manly, Manly. Jeez, eight and a half is a lot for this mob. Um, I'll go Manly Titans. Manly, Manly. Manly, Manly. Manly Titans for me in the Des Hasler Cup. Then uh, we've got a triple header on Sunday. Finishes off up in Townsville, North Queensland. $1.85 against the Dogs, two bucks. The Lions, one and a half points. Cowboys, one to 12. It's bloody 6.15 games. Someone think of the content creators, please. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go Cowboys, one to 12. Ugh. Cowboys, one to 12. Uh, doggies, one to 12. Dogs, one to 12 for me. In that there, last you have it. there you go. Tips for Face of Music brought to you by Sportsbet. Don't forget, guys, do the survey in the show notes for a chance to win one of two $500 cash prizes. Monday, 6 p.m., uh, the green and gold drop is happening. Very limited numbers. We've got the hats, got the jumpers, got the spray jackets, got the shirts. Give Rugby League Guru a follow on Instagram and on your podcasting. SC Playbook 1. Give Hammy a follow, Matty a follow. And as usual, we'll all go fuck ourselves. Thank you. Imagine what you could be buying instead. For free and confidential support, call the number on the screen or visit the website.